Okay, um, should we get started? I would say so, yeah. Okay, so um, as was uh, suggested in um, the previous sort of introduction, uh, we've got five groups of two. Each, each of the afternoon and this morning sessions will be two presentations with the exception of the last one. So um, the way we sort of organized it is, um, let's say looking at more global infrastructural issues and then kind of working our way down towards uh, more tactical interventions. So maybe strategies to tactics, if you will, um, both within the presentation, but also overall across the studio. Um, so we're gonna start with um, Jillian and uh, David, it appears you already know Jillian. Um, and uh, yeah, so away we go. And Caillou, so we're gonna present mobility kind of infrastructure on a larger scale, and then we're gonna zoom into both street design and micro mobility systems. But I'm gonna share my screen and I'm just gonna share my whole desktop so I can go full screen, so bear with me. And, and David, my annotate thing is showing up. I, I suspect at least with the review. Yeah, I think so. I got it as well. Okay. Is Caillou here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you want to request so that you can help or? Yeah, but since I, I can't uh, request to control okay. computer. Okay, so I will control, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah. So we are going to be presenting on mobility. Again, we're going to start at the mega regional and regional scale and kind of zoom into the city and then the district scale. So we're presenting on the district Prisma Alameda in Monterey, Mexico. And Monterey is located in the northern part of Mexico and is critical close to the US and Mexico borders. And Monterey is highly related with America in terms of commercial area and large amount of investment come to Monterey through the train. And it is connected with major America cities like San Antonio and Austin and Houston. Uh, the connection was enforced since the Inter-American Highway was began in 1930. And nowadays, there are daily regular buses coming from San Antonio to Monterey. So you can see the, the connections is between from the train to the highway and Monterey is highly related with America. And this is just a overall picture. So you can see where the DPA is located in the context of Monterey along the Santa Catarina River. And it is located right next to the historic downtown where the Macro Plaza is located. And I would still consider it a downtown district of Monterey. This was a map showing the connections through rail and metro, but also showing the surrounding neighborhoods. And to the north, it is well connected and to the east, with neighborhoods via rail and metro, but to the south and to the west, it is a little bit less connected. The automobile, as you can see to the map on the left, is like the dominant planning force in Monterey. So automobile wise, it is very well connected, but there still leaves a lot of room for the rail and the metro to expand, as well as for us looking in urban design to expand micro mobility. Uh, that's the streetwise analysis. And from the perspective from neighborhood scale to a big boulevard scale, the street has a very clear classification. And we will make our design based on this classification. Like the yellow one means the streets that are from nine to 12 meters. And it's very small uh, that are located in the neighborhood. And when the street goes wider, like the green one and the brown one, they are like 12 to 15 and 15 to 18. They are like the major connections. And the 
wrong one and the right one is that the big body part that connect DPA with the monetary with, with other district. And so this is an existing hierarchy diagram that was actually done on plan parcial, so it's been adapted. But there's really two, maybe three classification of roads. There's the primary avenues and then the sub collectors. And this is all based on automobile traffic. And then all the other roads are considered kind of smaller grain roads. And this was my proposed hierarchy of trying to bring in more layers and more complexity into the road network and to integrate pedestrian and micromobility systems. You can also see from this map that the neighborhood is already a little divided into zones. Um, the top, like the north, West corner is more of a residential area. There is some commercial there, but for the most part is primarily residential. And the Northeast corner of the district is a little bit more on the commercial side. Again, some mixed development, but for the most part, more commercial. So designing the streets, I used this hierarchy map to inform how the streets would be designed and what the feel of the streets would be. And the, another study I did was the existing directionality of the streets. Most of the streets in Monterey or in the DPA specifically are one way. And in some cases in the residential and in the commercial districts, that's okay. The streets are narrower and the traffic is already a little more calm. But in some of the cases, the streets are very wide. And so having a one way street makes it incre incredibly unsafe for pedestrians. And so this was a study I wanted to do to see where we could introduce two way streets. And so this is the change directionality, the dotted lines indicate two-way streets. And a lot of cases they were in, included more in the east-west directionality. And that is kind of the neighborhood corridors were changed into two-way to increase pedestrian safety while the smaller streets remained one way to kind of, I reduced generally the car um, allowance on the street. So it just increased public space. And this is another diagram that is adapted from the plan parcial and it's showing the public transit routes. The bus system is privatized in Monterey and in Mexico in general. So the government doesn't really have any control over where the buses go, but you can see a lot of redundancy in where the buses go and also where some of the gaps exist. And so this is a new proposed diagram of where the buses would be on the main boulevards and the neighborhood corridors and reduce the redundancy, but still allow access. Uh, well, in, in my personal design, I will focus on the micro mobility. So based on the classification of the roads and our proposed classification and hierarchy of the streets, I made this uh, micro mobility diagram. And orange one means that the neighborhood is how the street is connected with the metro station. And the green one is the big boulevards that connected the metro station with the waterfront. And the blue one is the bicycle lanes that are beside the waterfront. So there are three like three typologies of the separate like lanes. And inside this the, the neighborhood the district is reorganized into a share the streets like the pedestrian and the cyclist are uh, together on the streets. And so this is where I zoomed into the streets and public life in the district. And starting with my experience visiting Monter or the DPA in Monterey, um, the top photographs are all images relating to what the feel of the streets are right now. And then the bottom images are about the street art and the public life related to street art in the district. And there's actually quite a few murals and you can start to see people kind of privatizing and creating artwork in unique places. And this started to inform about how I wanted to design the streets. Um, obviously, working with Caillou, we are looking for a multimodal transportation network that incorporates buses and bikes as well as cars. But we're also looking to reduce car traffic overall. And I think that that is going to be a trend in the future, but it's also a priority in our design. Um, pedestrian safety was a major factor that we encountered when we were there. A lot of the crosswalks were 
not utilized or they didn't have crossing signals. And so incorporating those aspects and increasing accessibility is just allowing um, curb cuts and kind of basic accessibility issues. So you'll see that in also my street design um, and incorporating more crosswalks. Um, increased public transit, there is kind of a stigma against public transit, but I think having an efficient system that it doesn't, people are more likely to use it and want to use it. Um, integrated bicycle infrastructure, Caillou is gonna touch on that a lot more, but actually having integrated bicycle and um, micro mobility infrastructure encourages the use of that and destigmatizes it. And utilizing the streets as actually expanded social space. And that was something that became very evident on walking around the neighborhood is that the streets really are the social space. There are some parks, but for the most part, this is where people gather. Um, incorporating neighborhood identity, uh, I tried to incorporate into some of my designs, the textile design of Mexico, as well as the DPA it has beautiful views of mountains. And so kind of in just considering that when we were thinking about the design. Reducing vehicle traffic and prioritizing pedestrians through shared streets is going to be a big major part. And then also improved microclimate and utilizing tree and canopy to make the DPA a little bit less concrete. These were just some precedent images of shared streets and shared street design, as well as using art in the streets to increase uh, awareness of pedestrians and slow down traffic. So I'm gonna go through a series of um, conditions, existing conditions and sections, as well as our proposed. I'm gonna go through these quickly, but we can always go back and kind of address questions individually. So I'm gonna start as you enter the DPA. These are the two main streets. They're running north and south, and they you can see that they're very large, long streets that are just full of cars. And so in the proposed sections, trying to break up the street into more of a boulevard typology with a median dividing the street and a local traffic lane to the right of the main traffic. And on Quatemoc, there was a little bit more room. So having some areas for parking, but also more for like loading and unloading zones. And in the future, those areas could be transformed into parklets and public space in general. Also on both of these streets, there's a bike lane and on Quatemoc, there's a counterflow bike lane. And then these are the two streets, the Venastiano and Benito Juarez that are kind of on the edges of the networks and they're already two way streets, but again, they're still just very wide and difficult for pedestrians to cross. And so in the proposed sections, you can see the kind of boulevard typology, again, reducing the lanes for traffic and introducing bike lanes on both sides of the street. And then these two streets were pulled out from the neighborhood corridor typology, and they are two main streets that are utilized to connect the neighborhood to the surrounding area. Um, they're very unique streets in how they're utilized, and also um, the Cinco de Mayo street has a lot of interesting intersections. So I chose these as examples for what the neighborhood corridors could look like, but obviously they will change a little bit per street. And so the Cinco de Mayo, I reduced the number of lanes of traffic and introduced bike lanes again. And this goes into Caillou's micromobility that you will see later in having actual bike lanes integrated into the street rather than just being shared space. And then now we're getting into more of the heart of the district. This is up in the Northwest corner in the residential area. And a lot of these streets are a little more narrow, but they are around 50 feet, which is quite a bit of room to work with, especially if you're trying to like incorporate more social space into the streets. And so these are two different typologies that could be utilized. And I think the, my idea was that they could be utilized in a number of different arrangements, but one would be to have some amount of parking, and this is a back-in angle parking, but that back-in angle parking could exist for a few spots and then have more public space integrated or it can also be transformed over time. And then on the Serafina Pena, it's one street that changes a lot in the um, width, but this is a much more just shared street design, all flush with 
the sidewalk and bollards are there to protect pedestrians. And then up in the um, commercial district, you can already see vendors are kind of moving out into the street and utilizing the street for public space. And so taking that into consideration, oh, this is not the right one. Oops, okay. Um, then going into the perspectives, this is on Quatemuk as the, you would kind of come into or pass through the district. And then this is along the Cinco de Mayo. So coming into the network and seeing some of the shared streets and then actually being in the heart of the district. And Gil, could you just, uh, and she, could you just comment for a second on, you know, so you spent some time in the neighborhood. Um, what was your uh, kind of experience of the street grid and the street network in the DPA compared to some other cities you've been? Like what, you know, what was your, were these, were these, you know, just could you give some cues as to your kind of understanding or relationship of that street grid and, and the kind of dimensions on the street compared to some other cities or spaces you, you spent time? Yeah, do you want me to speak to that or Caillou? Either? Either. Okay. Um, yeah, it was an interesting experience. I mean, when I looked at, before we went, we did some research on, I wasn't really looking at streets at the time, but we did some research on the city. And this was a surprise to me. The streets can be very wide. And honestly, the vehicular traffic is very high in this neighborhood. and. I didn't feel very safe, mostly because of all the one ways. And you can see like cars are parked everywhere. Uh, there's a very clear delineation between what these spaces are designed for are cars and not for people. The sidewalks were very narrow and not in very good condition. And oftentimes you were pushed out onto the street, but the, the attitude of drivers is also very aggressive. And I think that that is, kind of a situation of after prioritizing cars for so long, that starts to kind of become part of the car culture. And so I think trying to break that was part of what I wanted to do in designing the streets. Cool, great, thank you, yeah. Okay, so this is for Caillou. Yeah. Do you want me to, do you want to start sharing so you can control it or do you want me to control it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can, I can just use your computer. You can control that. Okay. And it's my part of the research and I'm, I'm focused on the micro mobility. And the name is called Shuffle in DPA, make, making micro mobility work for cities. Uh, that's like a manifesto for DPA. And at present, the streets of DPA are more like space for passing than space for staying. Various models of transportation coexist in the absence of organization on the streets. The vitality of the commercial district and the charm of the city are gradually losing. And it comes to my research and analysis. And I will uh, come, there are three aspects like from the metro station, public space, street life, and how they are connected with micromobility. Uh, that's a metro station. Right, right now, you can see the original one is uh, line one and is underground and with the metro station. And also the working cycle, there are like five meters and 300, five, 500 meters and 300 meters. That's the five minutes working circle and 10 minutes working circle. As you can see right now, right, right now the working circle, they are not covered the whole DPA and people, maybe they are not, the DPA is not activity much. And with the micro mobility that bicycle roads connected with metro station. So the working circle can be reorganized And that's the current public plazas uh, in and outside DPA. 
They are, they are like Alameda Square, Micro Plaza, and Prisma Square. And they can connect it with the micro mobility. Like the dash line means the bicycle roads are connected public space and people can have a good visit of this public space. And that's the street life. And I think the street life is more connected with social interaction and culture because DPA is in the center of Monterey and it has uh, two, two heritage district too. So I want the, the street can be connected with the history and with the heritage that people can have a good, like a good memory of old Monterey. And also you can see the Pink one is a public space that I think connected with the culture, like the Macro Plaza and the, and the, and the ceremony. And I think because ceremony is also a good public space for people to memorize their ancestors and also they can have a better understanding of DPA. And the, the Blue, blue dash line means the cultural and commercial corridor. And I think the, the existing cultural and heritage zone can connect it with the Eastern part of commercial zone. So the commercial and the cultural corridor, they are connected. And the pink dot means the micromobility dogs that, that with these dogs, people can ride their bicycle or scooters so they can have a better understanding of DPA. And that's the micromobility system. And I will explain it from the plan and important notes and also the micromobility typology. That's you can see the, that's the abstract diagram. The, sorry. Do you want me to go to next? Boulevard and yeah, you, you can go and that's the overall back lane. The border dash line means the uh, main street and uh, and it has a separated back lanes. And the minor dash line means the, where the cyclists and pedestrians are together on the street, they share the streets. And the uh, stars means the dogs. The, uh, the micro mobility dogs that are integrated with public space or metro station or just on the streets, it connect with the street life. And also the circle. Oh, sorry, Caillou. The circle means the micro mobility that, uh, that are designed micro mobility public space. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, I chose three important notes that are very specific, like the Alameda Square, that's how the micro mobility inter interacted with public parks, and also the university, how micro mobility inter interacted with streets and the university. And also, there is a metro station that how micro mobility is interacted with it. And that's the micro mobility typology. And uh, right now, I think micro mobility is not just for bikes, since there are station based bike, stockless bike, and shared scooters. The station based bike is that uh, people can rent at a station and they can return at another station. And for the dockless bike, they, they don't need to have a very specific station, but they need to be parked with a defined district on the street or on the sidewalk. And the shared scooter is more like the dockless bike because they can, they don't have need a fixed home location. They can also be parked in a defined district. And that's my nose design with micro mobility. Also, there are three aspects, the metro station, public space and street life. And that's how micro mobility is interacted with metro station. And I actually can go to the previous slide. Sorry. 
the pink one is the sidewalk and blue blue one is the separated back lanes. Uh, also, it is interacted with the metro station. That when people comes out from the metro station, they can rent their bike or their scooters and they can go home or go to university. Yeah. And that's axonometric drawing of the, this part. And you can see when people, you can see the subways going underground and when they are come out from the metro station, they can ride their scooter or rent their bicycle. And also the separate separated back lanes is very efficient for people who ride bicycles. And also the three types of micro mobility is all in this part. And that's how micro mobility interacted with public space and I choose the, a corner of Alameda Square. And also it has a separate back lanes. And it's located on the Green Boulevard and between the Green Boulevard and the Alameda Square. And also people can ride, rent their bicycle or scooters in it. Also since, since it's a public space, the typology may be different because People, people, the people who come here are more like a visitor. They are not a regular user. So there may be more scooters. Mm -hmm. And that's also the axiometric drawing of this part. So you can see in this part, it has a bus, how the bus and the public space and they are interacted with micro mobility. When people come here to have a visit, they can run scooter to go go to the public plaza. And they can also, when, when people get out of the bus, they can run their bicycle and they can travel to DPA to other districts of DPA. And that's micro mobility integrated with street life. And that's the university we have a visit and the street is very narrow, so it don't have a uh, separate back lanes. That's how the pedestrian and the bicycle riders, they are together on the streets. So I just make the sidewalk wider so people can walk and they can also ride bicycles. And when, since, since uh, there are more students, when they ride their bicycles, they can go home or go to another space. And that's axonometric drawings of it. You can see the red one is a university. And when people get out of their campus or their school buildings, they can rent, rent their bicycles. And it's very easy for them to use. And that's a bird view, bird view for future DPA. Like with the uh, different typology of micro mobility. The street is reorganized. There, it has a separate back lanes that people can ride their bicycle. And also the district is also reorganized with this micro mobility that people can walk freely and it will be a pedestrian friendly district. And that's a future DPA. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kai, could you go back to the map that shows the metro <clears throat> station locations and the expanded um, uh, uh, the kind of walk or micro mobility shed uh, to the metro stations? I think that's a pretty important drawing. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, thank you, Jim. Yeah, could you just w walk us through this again? Yeah. Uh, so the circle means the metro station that are in DPA. And right now the five minute circle just cover a small part of DPA. And, and you can see there are many in public institutions in another part. So we, I think with the micro mobility, like the separate back lanes, 
that's connected with uh, this public institution and the metro station, the working circle is reorganized. That no longer like the used the working circle before. <clears throat> so the the kind of expanded boundary is the is the the kind of micro mobility uh, expanded connectivity to those stations with the micro mobility trip trip lengths anticipated micro mobility trip lengths. Yeah, yeah. I think there are like some fingers that connect the metro station with the inner part of DPA. Okay. And then uh, could you zoom forward to your uh, typology of micromobility for a second? Yeah. So could you just walk us through, like, are you, are you recommending that the district utilize all three of these systems? Could you just talk us through that a little bit? I mean, the, these three types. So, so there are, uh, I think there are uh, three types that uh, the station-based dockless, dockless bike and shared scooters. And since station-based bike is more related with a specific station, it's highly related with the docks. And since the dockless bike and shared scooters, they don't need to have a, a specific, specific docks, but they need to be parked in a designed area since we don't want the bike or scooter to be randomly put on the sidewalk, it may it may not convenient for pedestrian and also not convenient for people who ride bicycle. Great. So so in the plans you're showing, like the docking area for the uh, the, the station, there's docks for bikes, but there's also kind of a defined area for the scooter uh, pickup and. Uh, just to kind of question, are, are those charging stations, or is that, or is that just sort of like a, is it a parking spot, or, or it is, or is it also a, uh, a bike charging for the the scooter or the bikes? Uh, the station-based bike may be charging station, and also just, just uh, the scooter, yes. And for the dockless bike, since they, maybe they don't need to charge, they just need to park in a design area. Maybe the floor is paint into blue or some other color and you can park your bike here but it don't need to be charged <clears throat> great okay cool thanks thank you i mean maybe jill one way to do this is to um do you have this presentation open in uh, Adobe Acrobat? Yeah. I mean, one way to do this maybe is to go to thumbnails. Um, and that way, you know, if people want to make comments about particular drawings or ask questions about particular drawings, they can do that um, by, you know, just a suggestion. Could we maybe, could we actually maybe just start with the, the I, I think it's not a bad idea. I mean, I have the the PDF open as a download, so I can call it by pages as well as the other option. Just yell out pages to you, Jill. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll just keep it at this size then. This size. Could, could we just jump to page 55, the, 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 the kind of summary drawing that you guys made? So like, I just, I, there's a lot about this drawing I really like. Uh, uh, and, but I want to make sure I understand it. So the green quarters that are shown are actually these, they're, these are actually the larger streets for cars or they, are these are the, the multimodal streets? Yeah, they are the multimodal streets. That's the uh, existing streets on, in DPA. And right now it don't have a separate back lanes. And since in my design, I want this street could, be, uh, could have a separate back lanes. So I, I'm a little, I, I guess I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused because in, in one of the diagrams that, that Jill had shown, the streets between these streets had a kind of emphasis on bicycle usage. And these streets were, if, if I understood it, were the kind of primary, the, is that right? And so I'm trying to get a handle on what I like about this diagram is I like the idea that there's this kind of very large, almost mathematical order that's superimposed in the city that begins to give it some kind of a uh, a perceptual scale 
that you, as you move to the city, you begin to perceive. So every fourth block, there's a green line or every, and I actually like that a lot. I think it's actually a smart idea, uh, whether it's done by trees or by other things. I don't know. We can talk about that later on, but I'm just trying to get a handle on that. So the, I, I thought that one of the ideas was to separate out uh, pedestrians and bicycles from streets that had cars regardless. But it sounds like there's some disagreement there. Oh, there. So these are the like what I called the main and secondary boulevards, but we actually still kept bike lanes and wider pedestrian sidewalks on these streets. It was a point that we could have just taken the bike lanes off of these streets and they would have been only for cars, but it was a decision that the bike lanes were still there, but they still are three lanes of cars. So it's the only streets that are more prioritized on cars, but there's still room for the multimodal transportation and still bus lanes. Could you and put they are other sections of Pino Suarez and Cuauhtémoc for a second? Yeah, I don't, I think that's probably around 20. Hmm. 21. <laughs> This is the issue of a file. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, make that larger for a second. Might, maybe I'll or just, just do full screen or something. Right. <clears throat> so in this, in your proposals here, these are these kind of, as you pointed out, main arterials, north, south, one way, either direction. And you found a way to integrate both a, a kind of a, a boulevard configuration with slower travel lane for local traffic and um, two way cycle tracks, separated cycle tracks on Quatemoc, and then a one way. Did you say it was one way counter counter flow on Pino Suarez? Can you just walk us through these a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. On Pino Suarez, it's a little bit more narrow and it varies a lot, but so there's a one way bike lane that's five feet wide. It's protected by a, sh a small median that's next to the local traffic. And then on Cuauhtémoc, there's, you can see the two bike lanes and the one on the left is a counter flow and the one on the right is with traffic. So they are separate. They're closer to the sidewalks and they're more to the slower traffic, but on Cuauhtémoc, you can go either way. And then on Pino Suarez, you can go with traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back real quickly to the issue that David raised about whether there's a kind of macro grid superimposed on the district and what that means in terms of, let's call it both mobility, um, distribution of mobility, but also in a way, psychogeographic understanding of the district and the scale of the district. Um, so if you go to, um, let's say that diagram that Caillou did that has the big fat red grid on it, right? Um, which I think is a little, I don't remember, I don't know what uh, page number it is. Um, probably keep going. Oh, it's not that? Uh, no, maybe the, oh, keep going. I think, I think you keep going that one, there it is. right? Yeah. So that one is to me is really, really interesting in the way that it sort of says, you know, there are these main corridors, they make this kind of macro grid, they superimpose all of the, you know, individual constituents, uh, let's say contingencies within the district, which is one of the problems, right? That the streets are all sort of different widths and they're mixed and they don't seem to have a kind of, you know, rational organization to like why some are narrow or some are small. There may be some that, that you know, there may be some of those systems. And, and you know, this also in a way relates to your diagram, Jill, um, of looking at, you know, which corridors do what. And I think that's really pretty interesting when we can look at the relationship between so this sort of larger cognitive structure, right? In which like, I know that every, as David said, I know every fourth block, I'm gonna kind of encounter one of these lines that is gonna be special, right? All the trees on this street are pink, you know? Um, and then uh, how that works with the sort of distribution of traffic 
and the, the, the struggle, it seems to me, is how you negotiate in a way the rational idea of this with the, the real condition of the district, which is actually quite, um, uh, well, let's say it's less rational in the sense of the street widths and the different sort of conting contingency conditions, because it's actually made up of two or three different expansion um, zones, right? Well, I, I wonder if, but I wonder if, if, I mean, I wonder if this diagram could, this could translate several ways. I mean, I mean, for me, I, I do want to ask this question, which I, I think is really uh, uh, problematic. I mean, so there's an assumption here that there's going to be less cars, but there's also an assumption that there's going to be more construction and more people living there. And I, th I actually think that that means more cars. I, I, I really do. I, I think that, and I, I, so one of the options is that you do look at this diagram quite literally and say, look, the, uh, we're going to bifurcate this. And, and there are going to be these, these kind of, these things that are, that we're seeing here in orange, they're going to be streets with intense traffic. Uh, and it may be one way, it may be two way, but at least they'll have a kind of predictable format within the city. And the consequence of that is absolutely reduced traffic then on all the areas that are not that way. So this is a slightly different strategy. So rather than thinking of it as an overall kind of pattern of street development, you think of it as, as a kind of a, 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 a kind of larger uh, mapping plan that gives a, a kind of rhythmic organization to the city as Dean was, was beginning, Dean has a better word for it, about kind of psychophysical organization to the city. Uh, it, it's not the way you guys went. But the, I think that there, that realistically, it would be the way that you went if you admitted that there's going to have to be more cars in order to build the kinds of construction that, that are going to get people to move back into downtown in order to, it, that are going to leave the, sip, leave the suburb to move back into downtown or uh, uh, to build places to work or build corporate centers or to build that kind of stuff downtown. I, I, we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. I, I, I like this diagram. It would, it would have... They've gone a different way with a different presumption, and I, and I think that that presumption is still worth worth looking at, looking into. Yeah, I think that's a good, you know, that's a that's an important question about, you know, about the the kind of reduction in vehicular travel lanes. It's like, okay, well, where where are the the car existing cars and future traffic going to go? You know, on the other hand, I mean, I think there's what's I think interesting about the both the uh, gills uh, and, and she used street hierarchy and then also the micromobility is this real intent to build on this pretty major infrastructure investment that's been done in Monterey, which is these three metro stations. And the fact that the, the kind of uh, the um, plan partial and the TOD areas around those stations allow a significant reduction in, in uh, parking requirements in and around those areas. And that through this, uh, you know, uh, comp uh, um, complementary investment in <clears throat> improving sidewalk conditions and adding to mobility choices with micromobility, there's a real intent here to shift uh, the direction and to say that there is going to be more growth here and more intensity of development, but we're going to grow in a way that's going to be less accommodating uh, to the idea of prioritizing vehicular traffic. And, and so I think, you know, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a balance, but I think in this neighborhood in particular, building upon, you know, the, the fact that it's already got quite uh, a quite dense walkable street grid which you don't find anywhere else in, in, in Monterey, that there is real opportunity to shift the prioritization here and to move towards both accommodating growth, but also accommodating that growth with a, a, an entirely different framework for mobility. And I, I think what's, what I like is that these are all kind of pieces of the puzzle in terms of getting us there. I know. Uh, I guess I guess then the question really is a programmatic one because I mean, as I understand it, you know the the, the big reason these these particular neighborhoods in in Latin and South American cities are being abandoned is is precisely because the people who finance the construction economy or the constructed economy to a certain degree, they just want, they're just not happy with the car spaces. I mean, quite literally, it's like it, 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 it's moving out to the suburbs or moving out to these because and I, I don't I, I'm I'm not arguing for not prioritizing other forms of transportation. But I, I, but I think some secondary understanding of 
how you have to, you know, accommodate this devil's bargain is, is yeah. sent. I mean, you know, maybe there's a secondary lane and it's a, it's a con strategy where there are giant parking garages that serve these kind of 12 block or 15 block areas that, that are, are subdivided by the, the kind of, the kind of micro transportation systems, you know, but I, I guess I, I, that, I think the blanket argument against the car here as a kind of urban starting point, I mean, I understand where it comes from kind of socio-politically, but I, I think that it, it sidesteps this kind of really problematic economic reality. That's all. I think this is, uh, David, I think you're raising a critical question and, um, and thank you for doing that. Uh, you know, there's a, I think there's argument uh, uh, in favor also of um, some kind of shifting patterns, which maybe is good to look at. But nevertheless, I coincide with you in saying that we have to be very realistic about the uh, demand of, um, especially of the real estate market when it comes to space for cars, both in terms of um, um, in the in the road of, in the in the right of way and um, you know uh, in the provision of, uh, of of parking garages. So you know uh, there is some kind of balance to 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 get to in on, on this front. I, I would say there are some encouraging par um, shifts. Besides uh, what John already mentioned, which is the presence of the metro, as right. actually quite quite high capacity, there's also kind of a change in lifestyle where people in Monterey realize that they cannot build their way out of traffic. They are exasperated with their uh, ridiculous commutes, and so there is kind of a new generation of of regios that is interested in embracing a different lifestyle. Uh, you know, these are consider that um, there is a a pretty large class of well-traveled young professionals um, that are now finding this neighborhood uh, potentially as a place to relocate. Uh, they have been in other cities across the world. They experienced how it is to live in a city where you don't need a car to live. And so there is that kind of drive we could capital capitalize on for a um, considerable reduction in the dependency on, on the automobile. Uh, that said, I do, I do want to say that I... I, I really agree with you. I mean, we, we cannot be naive. We cannot be romantic about what the car demand will be in the future. What I, what I do see is that the scheme that uh, Caio and Jill are proposing here is actually quite flexible and would allow to be adjusted to whatever balance we are able to, to, to achieve in terms of uh, uh, car versus uh, other modes of mobility. So the way I interpret this diagram that we're looking at, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that there are this kind of orange um, corridors uh, and the green and the blue, which are accommodating obviously high uh, flow, especially the green and the blue of, of, of uh, car circulation, but they're trying to do it in a way in which they're also providing uh, sidewalks, in some cases, bicycle infrastructure. And then within uh, this, uh, these are literally super manzanas, right? Like uh, super blocks. Within the super blocks, you have areas where the traffic is mitigated, where the pedestrian and the bicycles are really a priority. So this system to me can be adapted in light of what David has said, because we actually don't know how many cars we will need to you know, have going through this system. So the orange and the green and the blue can be geared up toward vehicular traffic uh, or toward a more kind of complete and uh, um, slightly more um, pedestrian and, and bicycle friendly environment, depending on where that negotiation ends in terms of the actual demands of, um, of vehicular traffic uh, capacity in the next in the next decades. So uh, is that is that a an accurate depiction of what you're trying to show here, Jill and Caillou? Yeah. So, so you mean show the future? Yeah, I mean, in a way, 
I, I personally agree with David. We don't know how much you know we will be able to shift the paradigm of the mobility of the neighborhood. But it seems like your scheme would allow for some adjustments over time. Like you, you designated yeah. those calm I mean, traffic areas, and then I mean, the orange, the green, and the blue. We hope to be able to put, uh, you know, these wide sidewalks and and bicycle infrastructure, but that may not pencil with the number of parking spaces which right. will be built underground um, under those big towers that are popping up everywhere. Right. So we have to kind of allow those corridors to be adaptive to the actual demand as it will develop. I think it's I think it's even a bit more nuanced than that, which is that, you know, there's a there's a strong mandate citywide and nationally to basically uh, incentivize um, walking walkable and bikeable uh, communities in the city center. And I think that's that's the direction that the city's heading. I think the, the challenge is, is in this uh, se section of Monterey to be able to accommodate a lot of the through traffic, which I completely acknowledge, David, we're gonna, we have to, have to accommodate, right? The, along the Santa Catarina River is a major uh, kind of east-west connector. And then Pino Suarez and Pohatma connect you all the way to Austin, right? right? So we're not gonna be able to reduce the kind of volume there for that uh, regional and even international travel to, to, to a major extent. So we have to be able to accommodate that. Um, I think what's on the table here with, with, um, with Gil and, and Patty's proposal are two different ways of looking at it, which I think we should debate. One is, you know, creating a street hierarchy that really talks about separating uses, you know, uh, basically identifying uh, high, high vehicular mobility corridors, transit corridors, and bike corridors through a kind of really strong uh, uh, framework for uh, expanding the hierarchy of, of building upon what's already there versus what this diagram proposes, which I think is the, is the kind of Barcelona super Manzana model, which is that we're gonna basically make these red ones major arterial collectors. We're gonna give up on making those kind of pedestrian friendly spaces, but we're gonna, in return, we're gonna make these areas in the, the, the blue quadrants hyper uh, pedestrian hyper, friendly right. and, and really reduce vehicular traffic. Those are the two sort of, I think, uh, kind of dimensions that are on the table from the proposal, which I think are, are, are quite interesting to sort of debate the pros and cons of. I, I mean, I, 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 I'll, I'll put some of my cards on the table. I mean, I actually think that, that the whole idea of cars, it's so funny. I mean, it has to do, I, I, my first note was, wait, towers, towers equals cars, right? Like, that, that, like, you know, I mean, in cities where, where you have kind of towers and not cars, like Austin, what you're basically making a, is a kind of ghetto for 20 and 30 year olds, right, who can afford, to, who, who, who then, the minute they suddenly have families, just go, wait, I, you know, wait, I need to, like, find a way to make this work. And then, so you have a kind of downtown, which, which I mean, arguably, you can imagine it as having a, I, my assumption is that what you want is a kind of, a, this kind of, the, this, this district to have a kind of full kind of active city of life. But you could also imagine it different ways. You could imagine it like downtown Austin where you go, no, it's not. It's really a playground for people in their 20s and 30s. And, and then it's a place to work. So then, then, then people who have cars come in by Metro and they expand outward and we make this attractive enough to that actually, I think these, the, the walking districts, the walking lengths could actually be quite larger and uh, quite longer if these streets are as nice as you actually imagine them. So I think that's where the debate is. Debate is, 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 it really isn't so much the system as it is what kind of, what's the life of the city that you want to have in that central city? Do you want to be a place that's 24 hours a day or not? I mean, this is a big debate in Quito. Quito is a, it's an eight hour a day, 10 hour a day historic district. And then everyone lives elsewhere because they, they, can't, they can't make living downtown work in the same way. So I, I think there's that. I mean, I think there's a whole series of other things that we could talk about, but I, I do think that's the, that's the issue, which is the, what's the direction that downtown's gonna go, or what that historic district's gonna go. I think for me, uh, what stands out too on this project is uh, what's interesting is, you know, we're, talking about, we're talking about street networks and what we did deeper dive into micro mobility. And I feel like what's interesting is um, the reality of the bus network to this new mode of transportation of micro mobility and bringing a little bit of order to chaos. Um, Jill, if you go to page 13, 
um, you alluded kind of, uh, you know, David, just in general, like the bus network in Monterey is crazy. It's chaos. There's no order. You know, it, it's run by a different organization. Um, no one, it's the, the, the reality of it is um, just how it functions is really unknown. Um, and it's in the hands of that specific organization. But what's interesting is bringing the, uh, you start here in 13, the chaos of the bus network, you don't really, no one knows any routes. It's just, it's just absolutely nightmare. But then what the project does is they, they bring a little bit of order to it um, through kind of page 14, thinking about uh, the system of an ordered kind of transit. Uh, but then, and I think that's a great start, bringing a little bit of order to the to that larger network. So saying the Metro obviously has order, but then the bus network bringing that order there too. But then you you implement a new type of mobility uh, system, infrastructure, micromobility that brings, uh, it maybe takes the chaos from the bus network and brings it into that world. Um, where you have these three different networks of, you know, the, 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 the micromobility types. Some of those micromobilities have order in the, in their, in their sense of the, that they have dock stations. But if you think about the scooters in Austin, like there's chaos in that world too. So I think what's interesting is that this project brings a, a new a new uh, systematic thinking of mobility and it takes brings a little order to a larger systems and hopefully that can incorporate that but then the micro mobility kind of implements that that chaos into the into the uh, intermittence of the downtown uh, neighborhood and it's kind of um supplements that existing crazy bus network so the reality of that just the life um of the transportation system it, it, it goes from a larger macro system to this ordered macro system to more of a an ordered but chaos is sometimes a micro mobility system. I think that this project looks at that really well and I, and I really commend them on that. See, I wanna pick up a little bit, sorry, on the on the kind of idea of, let's call it the macro grid, the super Manzana grid. I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting things which was not explicitly a part of this presentation, but certainly was part of, I know, um, the research that led up to this piece, sort of earlier research, was that it's not a kind of uniform distribution of program across the district, right? There are certain areas that um, lend themselves more towards housing, um, in, you know, kind of dense housing with internal courtyards or certain areas that lend themselves towards, in some cases, even kind of single family houses. There are certain areas that lend them towards Sort of different structures. So what I find interesting is, you know, if you think about a kind of go game, <laughs> the way in which um, actually the sort of larger superstructure um, sort of allows different sort of districts to kind of fluctuate programmatically. Um, and I think that's in a way the challenge of the of the the sort of micro mobility system, right? Like when you have a separated lane, it's pretty clear that you know there's a sort of vector that one's meant to go on. But when you get inside these blocks, um, you know, anarchy <laughs> in terms of the scooters and other things begin to happen. Um, and my instinct is, you know, if you were to take sort of Caillou's expanded you know, micro mobility shed and uh, which is, I believe is based on the position of different sort of cultural and public spaces that you might wanna go to and you, you sort of map it against, you know, where do people live in the district in terms of kind of the historic fabric or how the different programs distribute. What I like about the idea of a kind of macro grid is it allows all of that to sort of shift over time. I have a couple of comments about the kind of material level of the, uh, I like some decisions you made in your di diagrams, just following on what Dean said, like if you go to, it doesn't really matter, 51, for example, like if you, any of Caillou's diagrams, but it, your sections work as well, Caillou's diagrams just happen to show everything together. I, I wanted to mention that, that for me, like with regard to material decisions, one of the things I don't like about the project is at, at all scales, all the effort and all of the material effort is at the streetscape. Uh, like literally the kind of place that's going to require the most maintenance and it's going to require and because and there's so much surface area that you guys have changed um i, I would have argued that certainly if you're going to set up this kind of like super avenue versus local that you concentrate on this kind of maintenance intensive local areas where you have to paint and plant and at, in those kind of smaller 
zones. And at this larger level, that you actually move those infrastructural decisions up, up above street level to the extent you can. A great example of this is in the major avenues in Sevilla in Spain, you know, the shade isn't provided by trees, it's provided by canvas awnings that they hang over the street at the sixth floor level. Which actually why we have rings in Goldsmith Hall that's based on those crazy, that idea. But, but, but the idea that you, that you move certain maintenance problems in these kind of major super mundane major blocks that no one's going to actually be vested in caring for uh, off of the street somehow and you, you, you actually increase that kind of bifurcated sense of these two distinct realities I think would, would only aid the project in, in, in being stronger. I mean, the, yeah. you, you just think about the amount of, and then actually the other kind of issue I, I just wanted to mention is that, that you have to also assume that the street section is going to be kind of, I mean, this has happened in Italy now. So Italy, you know, in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s was just busy pouring asphalt, as much asphalt as it possibly can. The assumption that maintaining infrastructure was going to be a, a high cost and that they needed permanent infrastructure. But in fact, it, it was a high cost because they poured asphalt and then they had to add in new sewage systems, new power systems, cable, you know, and, and actually actually shifting the shifting the the material consideration from the sidewalk to the actual street, which is what they did in Italy, right? They, they, they went back and took out concrete, took out asphalt and put that back in paving stone precisely because you had immediate ability to tear the street up very quickly without having to invest in large amounts of kind of infrastructural work. Uh, and, and then you also got the kind of added benefit that the street slowed cars down because it was the texture of driving over paving stone and you could get at uh, uh, and it added a kind of quality that was not then the responsibility of this kind of weird money in the city. It was, it, you know, like the weird money for keeping public space available, but the but the but the hard money for keeping streets paved. Right? It was so. I mean, I think there's some I think there's some kind of material concerns about these sections and diagrams that uh, actually also warrant kind of further consideration. That's actually a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting point and, and something we've thought about quite a bit is that, you know, the approach here is about <clears throat> separating uses, right? So, right. so uh, we know we need to accommodate, you know, better facilities for walking, biking and micro mobility. And the approach here is to say that, well, well, let's create, uh, you know, dedicated separated lanes for, for those uses, which, yeah, has a, has a, has a, um, infrastructure costs. Um, on the other hand, I think you got to look at the kind of the social costs of, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the, um, you know, pedestrian fatalities in this neighborhood is, is huge. There's just a, uh, it's a, it's a very, very unsafe place today. And so infrastructure costs compared to, you know, public safety, that's, that's one uh, consideration I would put forth. But, the, but I think the, the idea of whether or not we can achieve this kind of shift in public safety and mode balance if that requires this sort of uh, designation and separation of uses to the degree that is shown in the proposals versus more of the kind of shared street mixed uh, mixed traffic model, which may have less infrastructure costs and more flexibility in terms of adaptation. I think that's a really interesting uh, question. Yeah, I see it both ways. I mean, like, like you know, like the the kind of Amsterdam model of this kind of absolutely ruthlessly subdivided modal systems, where if you step as a pedestrian in the bike lane, you can be justifiably killed by a Dutch bicyclist, and and they'll win in court, right? I mean, as opposed to like in Italy, where there are, in the town I'm thinking of, in particular is uh, Ravenna, where they initially had a system like that, and then they went, they took, they tore it out, and actually the the the, the when you go down the kind of streets in the downtown area, there is a two colors of paving stone and they grade into each other. And one of them is intended for bicycles and one of them is intended for pedestrians, but they don't specify which one it is. And they don't, and there's this kind of weird gray zones in between. And, and that's what they have found simply works better. I mean, I noticed the kind of, there was that kind of diagram about the number of, the number of instances of jaywalking that occurred in, in, in during that kind of, you know, and you're going, yeah. You know, like the, 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 I don't know whether the kind of hard modal distinctions is going to in the end be the best that or whether or not 
uh, finding a kind of a, a kind of a, a way to blur where again yeah. the question of who maintains what and and, and 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 is is you know brought into play yeah i think it's a super interesting debate and and you know just to to, to go back to you know, this neighborhood used to have forty thousand residents and yeah and it accommodated that amount of density here without uh, the kind of reliance on um, uh, uh, um, kind of prioritizing automobility. And so if the neighborhood is to grow to that uh, level of density again, there's just, it's just not possible with that existing street grid and the kind of property line designations to accommodate. There's simply not the space to accommodate um, uh, in, in individual mobility the which has been shaping the patterns on the on the kind of periphery right. and and so uh there's there's i basically if the the Monterey wants to achieve the objective of redensifying the center i i think they they don't have the choice of supporting or inviting the kind of mobility patterns that have shaped the last uh, 50 years in Montreal. i just don't think they have that choice the space is literally is not available in the streets um, and 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 re regarding these two sort of trajectories of mode separation, you know, I mean, it's been demonstrated. Okay, Amsterdam and and places like Copenhagen, they they've fully leaned into this idea of of kind of separated facilities, and there's there's additional infrastructure costs, although compared to roadway infrastructure, it's a fraction of the cost. But those cities have been have achieved the greatest gains in terms of uh, mode shift. I mean. 50% of the trips in Copenhagen are, are by bike. And, and these aren't just 20 or 30 somethings, they're families. But families can only make that choice to do that if the infrastructure is there. So on the one hand, I, uh, I think that I like the idea of the shared street model for a number of reasons. On the other hand, you know, research has indicated that you know, people who are new to cycling culture are far less likely to utilize or, 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 or uh, make the choice to ride by bike if they don't feel safe. And that the kind of grade separated cycle tracks have proven to attract far more types of riders across kind of age and demographic uses. So it may be a sort of thing where for the first 10 or 15 or 20 years of the DPA's future, you have to have that kind of mode separation in order to attract the ridership and also to signal strongly that there's a change in mobility culture happening there. But over time, as, you know, uh, motorists and pedestrian cyclists become more familiar with kind of interacting with one another, you could move toward the shared street model. That's just... Uh, uh, so, I, so speaking of growth, I think we're going to move towards the next project. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we should move on, but I, I do want to maybe end on, on, on saying that I don't think that these two models are exclusive. Um, yeah. And I think that actually what this project points out is, a, is, is, a, is about is, um, is the possibility of a hybrid, which may be a good solution. Uh, I think that, you know, as a person that <laughs> just a few miles away, David from Ravenna, which is a city that I absolutely love. Um, <laughs> I am, of course, um, I think in favor of models that are looking at this kind of uh, um, sharing the, the right of way am among modes. And I think that in the project of uh, um, Jill and, and, and Caillou, that is really what is happening or what we imagine happening within the Super Manzana, right? In these kind of gray areas in the diagram, that is where I can see modes to be shared and that be working very well with the kind of the cultural, uh, you know, habits of, 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 of um, uh, you know, the regios, the, um, the, the regios lifestyle. But then I do think that in certain avenues and in certain roads or streets, we will have to do some much stricter separation so that that uh, specific statistics about hundreds of people jaywalking every hour on that boulevard, that is a, a you know, an eight lane boulevard uh, where cars speed as crazy. And that is really, you know, a situation which people are risking their lives. So I like to think of a model where you kind of mitigate those risks, risk with separate, you know, with separated 
infrastructure on those main corridors. And then you go back to a kind of a finer grain, slower, more shared, more mixed, maybe a little messy, uh, but not unsafe um, space within within the, the, the super manzana. So I think that it's kind of the two yeah, models. That's, that's what Gil, Gil had in her street section alternatives for the inner city or the kind of smaller blocks. There was a shared street model and like a dedicated bikeway model. So I think that was in the proposal. And I just want to, uh, it sounds like we need to move on, but I just wanted to say that Gil and Caillou, you know, the strength of your work here has resulted in this robust debate. And, you know, I know you did a lot of time investigating street hierarchy and, and street grid and trying to crack this very complex nut of the, uh, the Monterey downtown street grid and trying to really synthesize a lot of information. And then I think you've really pushed it quite far uh, um, in, in terms of your street sections. And then Caillou, I really, uh, I'm really pleased that you, uh, where you landed in terms of coming up with a framework for a recommendation for micromobility for the DPA, but also landing it in terms of where and how you would integrate those systems. And I really like the detailed thinking in terms of accommodating Peds, bikes, you know, pedestrian crossings to the bus stops. Like these are well thought through uh, in terms of the station area designs and in terms of a rational way of accommodating uh, uh, micro mobility, which in many cities now is just a mess because it hasn't been sort of planned for in the way you're proposing here. So great work, you guys. And, and the debate we're having is only possible because you've opened up so many kind of questions in terms of uh, because of your research and investigation. So nice job. Thank you. Great job, Jill and Titan. Awesome, awesome, you guys. Thanks, Jill. Okay, so uh, let's move on to Shelby and Emraham. Hi. Shelby. Hey. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to introduce myself just because I see that there's people from. Today on the call and I've been waiting my whole entire life to make this intro, which is this is my last day of architecture school, which is incredible. Um, but and I'm Shelby. <laughs> I'm Emrahan and I have two more years of architecture school. <laughs> <laughs> and we were looking at urban morphology of um, the DPA. So and, and I'll interject here and say that both Shelby and Emrahan are actually undergraduate um, Bachelor of Architecture students. Not... I'm a Master's of Architecture student. Sorry, you're a Master's student. I'm the undergraduate. But you guys are not um, urban design students per se. Right. So our stuff is a little unconventional, I think, but maybe that all worked to our advantage. <laughs> um, so some of the very early research that we did um, in terms of the DPA was looking at um, the existing morphology of the district. And we found in it these implicit boundaries that were existing. So kind of how Jill had pointed out in the northern part of the DPA, you get a rather um, regular um, uh, block size that is this very walkable 80 by 80 meter um, condition. Sorry, my file is going slowly, but um, then there's this in-between type of district that's um, full of all these street irregularities and it ends up resulting in these very large blocks and also these um, kind of oddly shaped blocks. And then it, towards the river, you end up with this historic fabric where you have these larger freestanding buildings existing on these large blocks. And then another thing that's playing a major role in the zoning of the district are these urban corridors that Jill just mentioned. The um, yellow uh, hatches on this map are all the structured parking that currently exists in the district. So you can see that there's a lot of commercial activity going on in the east side and not so much on the west side based on where people are parking their cars currently. So we really tried to model all these things. Um, and using some of the information that Gal had previously given us, you can see when we look on, at the district and axonometric that it's really low rise consistently throughout the entire district with these 
poking up towers that are starting to emerge. And those are only going to multiply as people begin to move back into the district. We also started to look at building taxonomy that was going on. So in that more historic neighborhood, there is a significant number of freestanding homes that are single family housing that exist within the property lines. Um, as you move a little bit further north, you have these adjoined courtyard homes, which um, over time, as they've been passed down from generation to generation, the homes have been split. So you end up with these super long um, property divisions that really um, are not great for the urban fabric. And then there's the new construction that's happening. So that stuff is a little bit more higher rise. Um, and then you have the towers that are making their way into the district. Okay, so the plan parcel is the set of rules that regulates what the urban fabric really looks like in the district. So within the plan parcel itself, they uh, split the district into zones that, spec that um, specify areas that are purely residential to mixed use to um, commercial, just mainly commercial itself. And on the left is the actual um, what they want to achieve as far as the zoning and the way the lots work. But on the right, it's what actually is actually occurring within the district. As you can see, because of the lots makeups and the sizes, you can't actually achieve what they're, what they're really going for. And um, they use these zones to determine what the actual buildings and the envelopes and the building heights are, depending on the zone that the lot is in. And this is a section that shows how the uh, building envelopes are created. So as you can see, the base is a mirroring of the street width. And after that initial base, there's essentially a three meter, there's a three meter step, step back. And from there on, it depends on the zone that, that the uh, lot is in. But in this section, you can see that you can run into these crazy towers with unlimited FAR with um, an endless number of floors and heights. And that's what some of the more extreme conditions that are existing within the commercial areas of the district. So you just recap that. So there's a, there's a, there's a set, set uh, ground floor setback and then a step back at, at, um, Yes, so um, the way the ground floor step back works, they double the existing current sidewalk width, and then using the street width along with that new sidewalk, they create the uh, height of the base of the, the buildings. And from there, there's a three meter step back. And then from there on, um, your height is determined by the zone that the lot is, is in. Cool, thank you. And this is what um, these sets of rules will essentially result in with the right commercial side of the district um, having these massive towers, which juxtapose the left side where most of the residential blocks are located. So this drawing really points out the main issue that we saw with the plan parcel, which is that you have that low rise existing infrastructure butting up against these super high rise tower developments, um, which kind of guided us into our strategy for the district, which is a mixed use mid rise based strategy. So we tried to kind of diagram at, at the top um, what the condition of the plan parcel might result in as compared to what a more mid rise based condition might result in. Um, try to compare that to some of the other cities that we found successful mid-rise development in and using mid-rise as the main uh, form of densification for the district. So we established these three um, block forms, which are low-rise, mid-rise, and high-rise. So low-rise will be two to four stories, and that's going to exist in that neighborhood condition. And it'll be residential dominant with commercial activity existing 
in the four story conditions. Um, mid rise will be five to seven stories and this will act as the primary urban condition with the entire first floor being um, for commercial use and acknowledging that there is going to be high rise development that happens trying to contain that to the urban corridors and the riverfront development so kind of trying to sum this up into a thesis, we wanna increase density by putting the, um, the emphasis on mid-rise and then increase porosity. So this is a focus on um, the ground floor condition with 15 second facades in order to um, increase the um, walkability of the blocks and then like quadrupling the amount of access into the interior of the blocks as well as into commercial activity on the ground floor. So this is our proposed zoning. Um, you can see this low rise condition is the lightest condition. The high rise is the darkest condition and the mid rise is what makes up the other 50% of the district. Um, and we're gonna get into some of the strategies that we're using to form each of these blocks, but you can see by putting the mid-rise in place in the district, it really starts to blur the lines between the low-rise development and the high-rise development, hopefully creating a better urban condition, um, hopefully exemplified in this small portion that we cut out. The blue um, that was shown in the previous maps are what we're calling culturally significant zones. So sorry, something I forgot to mention is um, later on, there'll be a discussion about this large university infrastructure that starts to make its way through the district. So a little sneak peek of that, but um, trying to make that blend into the urban fabric a little bit more. Okay, so to create that um, condition, we implemented a strategy where we took the existing condition um, and we looked at the property lines. And as you can see, just from this example, there are multiple lot properties that are more really narrow and thin. And um, we wanted to create more developable lots and then extrude those lots. And going from there, uh, differentiating the heights depending on, upon um, certain, certain aspects. For example, the southeastern and southwestern sides of the lots were higher than the rest in order to account for the sun shading aspects of the, of the area. And from there, within the low rise and mid rise, we ended up punching courtyards um, within the lot itself to provide for public space for, for the residents. And we really wanted to prioritize the street condition and having a uh, porosity so that there would be a more walkable and enjoyable street uh, for the pedestrian and um, taking all of these aspects into account, we created building envelopes that would be, that would determine what, um, what the urban fabric would actually look like. And just something to point out quickly is that um, instead of saying that all the low rise block envelope is a four story condition, we actually are differentiating that by lots. So there are um, building envelopes within a block that do only have a two-story height limit and that's in order to encourage um, smaller scale development not a huge developer has to come in and buy the entire block and develop it but rather a small business owner might be able to buy their own space and develop it as as they want yeah that was that was a question i had uh, just about the, the, the move of punching the perimeter courtyard blocks. So if you've got multiple owners there, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's the, what's the incentive for, uh, you know, owner A in one corner of the block, if, if it's not one owner, let's say, but it's still like, let's say four or five or six, what is the incentive for that individual owner to say, all right, well, I'm going to give up half of my property to create this shared um, courtyard. Just curious about you know what the mechanism is there to achieve to basically create that um, void in the center of the block. Yeah. So one of the um, numbers that was included on the um, plan parcel charts was the amount of the um, property that you could actually develop, 
in a lot of parts that was like a 0.7 number. So trying to actually demarcate where those courtyards would be before any new development happened. And then the incentive would be for the property owners to follow those lines. So it might be something that's actually written into the zoning condition. That's interesting. Um, so, so through the lot coverage, but sort of specifying where that lot coverage happens to correct. result in a kind of an aggregate interior court. Hmm, cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's, instead of setting back from the street yeah. or taking taking property away from um, private ownership at the street in order to, to let's say, double the width of the sidewalk, the streets are redesigned in order to allow for more public space in, in Jill and Caillou's project. And then this sort of inverts the subtraction yeah. uh, of private property to the center of the block. That's cool. Okay, looking, and then we took a look at the three zones that we had specified with low rise, high rise, uh, low rise, mid rise, and high rise con conditions. And um, first we looked at the existing, and then from there we proposed what the transition would be in, say, 50 years um, as the district moved more towards what we were envisioning. And this is the ideal, uh, ideal of the low rise development where you have uh, residential for the most part with commercial within the corners of the lots and the, the use of the courtyard space for the, for the uh, residents within the area. And this is a section going through the uh, ideal version of the uh, low rise development, as you can see, the commercial and residential and the uh, courtyard, which is primarily more so private, private to the uh, residents within the block itself. And then going from there, we looked at the mid rise development with the existing condition and then the transition period where you have, um, where you start to have more so these six story. Uh, buildings where you have um, more of a mixed use condition with uh, commercial at the bottom, bottom floors, and then from there on uh, four or five stories of residence. And this is the idealized uh, version of, of those types of blocks where again, you have the commercial and the courtyard and the four to five, uh, three, four, five, six story uh, buildings. And the section shows um, the commercial and residential and how this the courtyard within the uh, mid rise blocks are more so uh, public compared to the low rise development areas. And finally, the last condition with um, the high rise where we again took the existing condition and showed the transition to where um, mostly developers would come in and this where you start to see more of the towers that that oppose what's actually occurring within the district with parking dominating the, the bottom floors. But instead, we wanted to uh, just stop that from happening by uh, having commercials, commercial areas on the ground floor. And then from there, um, having the residents and, and um, as well as having offices closer to the ground floor so that there would be more of a live work uh, balance within the blocks themselves. And this is a section showing the, um, that relationship. And we wanted to, we wanted to stop the, the idea of just having a, um, building envelopes that were essentially just, just um, large towers that, that just extruded from the lot, but instead these have more of a base within the towers that would allow for spaces such as the one shown in this section between the towers themselves. And all the parking's buried, no parking on ground floor. A question on the Plan Parcial existing guidelines in terms of um, uh, floor, floor plates. So I'm just, you know, I, I know that there's, I think there's a minimum lot size to, um, 
qualify for the the kind of up zoning i think it's like 2000 square meters or something um yeah it's actually a thousand square meters uh, but within the district it's within like the set of rules itself one developer could for example buy the whole block itself and then all of a sudden what was just a like a 300 square meter lot now becomes part of a larger larger set that right ultimately allows for these the crazy type of construction that, that we yeah and is there i can't remember is there guidelines for floor plate minimums or maximums for 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 uh for for, for towers um as far as i know there there isn't uh, a minimum or maximum the way they they specified is just free as in this is you have unlimited reign as to what you could do I, I, I mean, I think, sorry, I think this is where a kind of interesting way into looking at your proposals will come up as soon as you're sort of done. And that is to say that I think that the, there may be regulatory questions around floor plates, but there are also, let's say, building code questions around yeah. floor plates. So, you know, if it's a residential tower, at least if you follow the Urban Land Institute model, you know, the standard size is sort of 80 by 80, right? Because you need to get light into all the apartments. So I think, you know, we can come back to the to the type, typologies, but I think, you know, you're gonna get different thicknesses, different depths for retail than you're gonna get for housing above. Um, totally, and then, yeah, bring it up, because it just, it'd be some of these more vertical towers look, look kind of bulky, but I just wanna make sure I'm kind of getting it right in terms of what the uh, guidelines are. I mean, this is a very good point. Yes, I think that John is reacting to the fact that some of these buildings do look a little fat for adequate so solar exposure to the inner part of the building. The Plan Parcial, um, as uh, Emiran well said, um, doesn't uh, prescribe uh, anything with regard to the width of the building or the depth of the building with exception of I think, um, if I remember correctly, Shelby and Emerald, an overall maximum coverage uh, of the lot. So you cannot occupy 100% of the lot. You probably can occupy a smaller percentage. I don't remember if it's 70 or 80. It's, it's, it's 70. 70. Okay. For the most part, it's 70. But within the commercial areas, I think it starts to, the number starts to rise. So in terms of code, there is just that restriction. As Dean said, of course, the building code may provide further regulation. And then there's, you know, kind of a design uh, issue, right? Uh, the designers, I think, would probably also look for maximizing the quality of, of what they're building by, by providing the right um, depth to, to the envelopes that they are developing. And that was the point that I wanted to make is that these last images that we show are not supposed to be prescriptive. They're just examples of what can go on. Um, with the um, overall zoning that we've laid out, these um, tower, yeah. these, yeah, the squares that are in here are 40 by 40. 40 meters by 40 meters. So those double up in some areas. So you end up with 40 by 80 conditions. Um, but yeah, we, that's definitely something to keep in mind um, in terms of. Could you, go, could, could you go to the next sheet? And I wish the blue, I, I wish the blue actually crossed the major avenue there that the, the, the university, the culturally significant spaces should cross that primary avenue just at that one space right there mm -hmm. you really you really wish that was just a that figure you know that those blocks right there that you gave those away um, i had a question for you just you guys mentioned this thing about sun from the west and the south in monterey don't you want winter sun isn't it cool at during the day in the winter time so it's a weird question I, I, i'm asking it for a weird reason I, I, I i'm trying to get a handle on what you guys are doing, and, and 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 thank God I'm not a planner because I get to be critical about this architecturally. And I have, I have I'm, there's a lot about your project I like, and then there's some things about that, that that I find really interesting. I'm trying to get a handle on where how you guys are making these decisions. So could you go? So the thing about the sun I found really really interesting because could you go to the next slide? Yep. 
So one of y'all's zoning proposal. So I like the zoning proposal. I mean, I, I had this no go. Shall we go back one? Or Imran Hunt is yeah. So I like this one. I don't know that you get the same or you achieve the same total square footage as the what the plan partial allows, which is a which is a, in all fairness a kind of number that you guys should just present up front and just say, look, this is this is the trade off. The trade off for having this kind of uniformity in the city is this amount of square footage that could be developed. But I was trying to think, so this is like a form based zoning proposal. You're saying we, you know, we have a, we, we're going to propose what the form of the city is. And like, like the form of the city, which is not driven by necessarily by usages or it's driven by a, an idea that we have as architects and planners about how the space of the city might carry meaning separately from how the circulation works or how, how you perceive the organization of a, the value of our culture based on the way we've uh, construed the space of the city. If you look at this diagram, I think that there's many things that are commendable about it. But one of the things that it is, is, is like a, it's trying to imagine a kind of responsible, like this kind of wayward teenager that's growing into sort of a responsible, you know, middle-aged adult, you know, kind of as a city, you know, like it's, it's got this kind of idea that it's, what it, it's trying to protect what's been good historically and it's trying to stave off to a certain degree the inevitability of the irresponsibility of individual developers. I mean, this is the classic nightmare that's happening in Austin, right? Like all of West Campus the University wanted to control that. The, the state legislature didn't allow the university to control that. And as a consequence, it's out of control, right? It, it, and and it, we could have staved that off. We could have planned it. We could have we could have held it at bay, and and we could have ended up with a instead of what we're instead of what we're getting. So then there's these different things that drive, uh, you know, that drive zone based form based zoning, and one of them is, and I think in your case there's a little bit of nostalgia, about, a kind of nostalgia about a city that you want to have in a way, and and a city like that in a diagram like this. And this is where I, I think it, it, it requires further development. It, you, you look at the, di the later diagrams about these kind of where it's going to transition to, and you realize that, that really what it is is a transitional city, which is going to then, it's just going to simply have this inevitable pressure to push beyond this kind of formal envelope, unless there is some strict definition about why this formal envelope makes sense. Like, so for example, in Paris, the mansard roof, the line of outer DC, or there's something that has to restrict it, right? Like it, it's, it's restricted because of, a, of a, a proportion of streetscape, or it's restricted because of a view of a set of things, or it's restricted because of, this is, gets back to the environmental ones, because environmental ones are like ones I think that you could argue for, right? Or, or alternatively, it's held down in place by things that cross over it. I mean, it struck me that there's this really interesting a, a, a core idea behind the plan partial zoning envelope, which is there's a low rise city with a stealth high rise city behind it, right? That, that, that's the, like that, that floats over it, like that spaceship over it. Johannesburg in, in that, you know, like that great movie with all the aliens that come down, it's just floating over it. And that, that some usage could be had about that, like, like that there could be, that, that, like what, what this diagram lacks for me are, are the things that keep it at this height. And it might be that those things are architecturally developed streetscape sections, right? That, uh, or they're details of long-term views of the mountains, for example, to the south. And it's an extraordinary set of mountains that, 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 that might impede on this much as Phoenix is limited in that way. Or it might be that, that the things that, that limits this are, are, are actually buildings that, that float over the city, that maximize housing as a thing that doesn't occur at the streetscape, but actually is reconceived as a, as a thing. I mean, there's a, Todd Williams and Billy Chen did a radical proposal, got a lot of flack for it years ago for just going, we leave this city the way it is, and then we build a whole new city above it that, that actually becomes the place where people want to live. And then you work and you do commerce down in the city below. So, I mean, I think that, that for me is where the project is kind of waiting to, to kind of leap into. I think it's a very, very good project. And I think it's stopped at this kind of point where it's most interesting, where it has to assess what were the values that embedded, there's nothing inevitable about this plan. You have to make a kind of value-based argument for why this plan makes more sense since you're giving away developable area. Uh, no problem. I mean, that, this is a D, that's the thing that held DC in check for so long and Philadelphia in check for so long. And, but those are the things that in, under the pressure of this unrelenting capital desire to make money, invariably slip somehow. So, I mean, 
I'll, I'll leave my comments there. I, I, I like the project a lot. I, 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 it's the kind of project you go, all right, Shelby, you thought you were graduating, but you, you know, uh, but you know, another semester's worth of thought on this would be really awesome. You know? <laughs> Are you guys done? Is this, is this, the, did we get to the end or did we interject with questions before you finished? No, that was the end. That was the end. Okay. So I do, I do think it's important, D David's question about the development capacity uh, in the uh, Plan Partial zoning framework versus the development capacity for your proposed condition. I do think that is a really key piece of data. I think we chatted about it before. Maybe you've done that calculus. And then you have to sort of balance that against what the sort of predicted or projected growth for the neighborhood is in the Plan Partial, which I think, which I think is to get back up to 40,000 residents. And that's the constraint there, as I understand, is, is like infrastructure, is water and power and sewer. It can really only accommodate that amount, that, that amount of growth. So to some degree, what's in the plan partial in terms of urban form <clears throat> may, <clears throat> may not be aligned with the constraints that are established by infrastructure capacity. All that being said, you, you know, this is a, a really cool example of a form-based zoning approach, but I do think it's important to understand what the implications are in terms of uh, kind of development capacity from your proposal to the previous one. Just curious if you did, if you did some of that uh, analysis. We did not. Did. <laughs> yeah, but we will, we will. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, what's interesting, um, just the way that it's laid out, you know, form-based code, but also transect um, the way that you basically, you're, you're you're also challenging too, but the way you're, you're laying it out, you're trans it's really about these major corridors. And if we're looking at this as a future model for the Monterey, you know, if, if the DP is this future model, the way I'm looking at it now is that you're basically saying um, high density is only allowed on major corridors. And I guess I would just challenge that in the sense that I would, I would like to see more higher density around open space as well too, and having access to that density around parks and plazas and stuff. And I think the, the, the Alameda Park could have some more density, but I'm just challenging this to the sense of, this is a model for the city of Monterey. And this is, you know, if we're looking just at DP uh, neighborhood, I'm only seeing really the density on major corridors. So then I, when I look at a bigger scale of this, I just, I'll, basically there's major parks around the whole city and how can there be other systematic thinking of uh, density just related to not not just related to the network of streets and, and the hierarchy there but what are other systems what are other opportunities for density so open space is one you're the, obviously you're doing the riverfront but um what you know further further um thinking a little bit more about that as well and this cultural significance zones too that someone's highlighting here um as opportunities opportunities as well so but yeah yeah those those are all bordered by the mid-rise condition, uh, but yeah, agreed with those becoming a little bit more dense around there. Yeah. I also want to go back to another point that David, David raised, which is like, there's this implicit assumption in the proposal that mid-rise is better than high-rise and that perimeter block is a better uh, block typology than the sort of fragmented individual ownership block. So, but there was no description of like, well, why? Why should we change our whole plan partial code and, and enforce this, you know, reallocation of lot coverage to get these interior blocks? Like, well, what for? What, what, what's so good about, uh, about that? And I know you've thought about it, but maybe you could explain a little bit of that, Emrahan and, and Shelby, what's the driver for you or the principles behind your approach in terms of prioritizing mid-block perimeter, uh, mid-rise perimeter block topologies here. I already see Giggle smiling because he knows what my answer is. And it's, we treated Soft City as a Bible this semester um, and kind of were looking a lot at the dense low stuff that David was describing in there. Um, so that's where our initial um, observations came from. And we established that very early on. I agree that for future development adding um, explanation of that stuff in there would be useful, definitely. 
I'm just thinking about if we get this in front of the city of Monterey, it's like we'd have to articulate, you know, the your proposal would have to sort of in, 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 describe those principles that inform your uh, approach. Right, right. This is the heart of the matter because because I think that, you know, um, David framed it very well. So there there is in every city a tension, of course, uh, between uh, you know the desire of unlimited development uh, that uh, capital is is putting pressure on versus the will to regulate and with with cities across the world, you know um, having a, a stronger or or less strong tradition of of uh, regulating and imposing through regulation a certain urban form. Now certainly Monterey is an interesting point in history where um, is, is, is trying to, to, to understand what, what the way forward for, for, for itself can be. And, and this project can, can help kind of illuminate some of the possible paths. I very much agree that, uh, you know, uh, because your project was so um, demanding in terms of analyzing the uh, Plan Parcial, um, building three-dimensional models that would show what the Plan Parcel would allow, finding an alternative to that. One thing that you may have not expressed in the presentation um, well enough is the values that are driving the decision of this kind of um, development. Um, and the way I think of it, I don't think that what you're after is some kind of traditional way of thinking, the transact, um, but it's rather, and I think we talked about it quite a bit, is rather the kind of um, life of the city that um, this kind of density could inform is the experience at the street level, is uh, the way in which, uh, you know, um, mixed use is advanced in a radical way. It's that kind of messy and lively vibrancy that you're after. And I think that, um, it would be a great compliment to this presentation because you, it's almost like what we're missing is seeing how it feels uh, at street level to be in a city that is like this versus uh, you know, what, um, what the Plan Parcel may inform in terms of um, high rises with um, big parking garages that in most cases are actually over, just like in Austin, you know, they're over, you know, they're not underground, they're over the, the surface. So they, they occupy the, the many, many stories uh, from the ground level up. So maybe that is what would have kind of made your argument even strong. And because the pressure of development and capital is so strong in so many cities, we, we do need to be able to articulate those arguments super well. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, we will not be able to uh, to push forward with with alternative agendas. Yeah. So, can I add something? Sorry, go ahead, David. Well, I was just going to say. I mean, this is the this is the core issue here because I mean, really, what we're looking at is the desire, and it's not just you guys. This is this is desire has been is latent in architecture for the last. 30 to 40 years, which is how do you return some form of predictability to the late capital, the late capital city? You know, I mean, how do you do it? You know, and it's actually really hard, I think, Chigo, to make the argument uh, because the, I mean, because the counter argument is OMA, right? OMA has made the counter argument that in fact that the late capital city is its own ideal form, you know, and so I, that's that's why I think that that when you make the argument, if you if you you have to have like incredibly powerful cultural ammunition and i mean i would argue the only the only level of ammunition you could make these days that way is environmental i mean so for example just to draw on your thing here and this is why i was asking about the sunlight you go well what's really interesting is this section right here right you go like in theory a kind of low winter sun justifies that consistency in the city not the fact that this was residential and low rise not the fact that this is, you know, the university, you know, the, 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 the operation of the university in a certain way, you could argue for it functioning, envi again, environmentally. You know, like, like I, I think you have to kind of ask yourself, how do you transition this desire for consistency, which, which flies, it, it, it is the, it is the, it's the pre-marketplace city, the, the lingering memory of that, that unified city that 
the capital, late capital in particular city has just thrown into the trash can. I mean, you know, the, the other alternative for it is that you, that you, 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 you allow within this system the possibility of Prada buildings, you know, that, that within it, there are, there, 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 are, there are, you know, localized moments where developers might be allowed to give it some kind of an organization out of the Prada building, you know, that begin to give it a kind of organization that allows for some, you know, that, that, that allows for that inherent, like, destabilizing that the marketplace brings. So I mean, I think that's the kind of point that you know, Gigo brought it up. I, I I think it requires further clarification because otherwise, otherwise you're arguing against money, and you just you you know if if if, if you if you're not coming with 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 with, with like high level morality or religion, you you've got nothing. You you've got nothing against money. You know, sorry. It's fine. I was going to say, you know, there's that interesting argument that um, was made in the 1970s about the idea of the horizontal skyscraper, which is to say that, you know, when you build vertically a tower, you're going to get a donut of sort of subtractive landscape around it right. having to do with parking and everything else. That's the kind of Barton Myers thesis, right? right. Versus, you know, you turn the, you turn the skyscraper sideways <laughs> And you know you can get the same kind of capital investment, but it's sort of more equitably distributed across the blocks of the city. Um, and I think that's kind of my reading of what the strategy could be here. Um, and that's why I think the metrics of you know developable area and all of that stuff, you know, in addition as a sort of corollary to the kind of cultural questions, um, is important. Um, one other sort of slightly adjacent topic that I think um, is interesting about this proposal is, you know, when we talk about, say, form-based codes, um, there are different sort of strategies for coding the form of the city. You know, one of them is the sort of slightly retrograde, you know, um, form-based code institute in the United States where we're absolutely prescriptive, right? This is exactly exactly the way the city will be. And that's a little bit also Hausman's Paris is, is that way also. Um, the other way, which is a little bit more um, experimental, maybe more European today, is to say these are actually not um, uh, legislative forms of buildings. These are actually maximum potential for property. Um, and then there's a, you know, so Frank Gehry could actually build his sort of cauliflower building, you know, inside that if he wanted right. to. Right. Um, but there are certain things that you absolutely must do. And maybe those happen at the ground. Like I, I, at the ground, I have to pay attention to the porosity and the condition of the street. You start getting above certain heights and then individual architects have a certain degree of freedom within a set of limiting kind of parameters. And that's the way I read your proposal, which when you get back into your section, your building sections or your blocks kind of later on in the proposal, you know, it would be interesting to sort of draw the relationship between what the typologies might suggest from a kind of, let's say, architectural position, you know, how much light gets into the housing. So therefore, you know, the floor plate's not as deep as you're drawing it versus what's actually allowable um, within the sort of, let's call it envelope of the sites. Um, it's a great and you'll point. find, I, yeah. I was, reading, I was reading this as maximum building envelope too. And, and uh, although my question around, around floor plate size is maybe because I was sort of, you know, not, not sort of holding that in my mind that this is maximum envelope. What I really like and I think is unusual is your depiction of the kind of phase or transition of existing ownership regimes to this future conditions. I really love that in that it's not kind of proposing this kind of complete erasure <laughs> and then the new urban form that actually it's gonna be hybrid and funky and sort of iterative to get towards something. To me, that is, it's wonderful to see that because it, it, it implies some truth about the kind of nuance of the city and the relationship between something like a synoptic form-based code and the actual condition of, uh, of Monterey. I do think though that it, it would be useful as 
you know, Dean's implying that. So from your kind of um, maximum building envelope block schemes to then take it one step further, which is to say, well, here's how this might be expressed with uh, a, a type of architecture that, you know, uh, would fit within this envelope. And not that you have to design all the buildings, but to say, this is the type of um, architecture that we would expect to show up within our form-based code maximum building envelope environment so that we could translate uh, what the maximum building envelope means to what, what the sort of likely outcome in terms of uh, the kind of built form would, would be. I think that's, that's it. These that's are, yeah, sorry. That's a great point. I just wanna add one dimension that, you know, as we discuss, um, you know, seems interesting to me um, is also that uh, then this kind of regulation that you are uh, suggesting can also be seen as a, a sort of med mediation among the different forces at play. So we talked about, you know, uh, the pressure of capital on one end. It, it is also true that many neighborhoods like this across the world, including the DPA, you know, have other forces maybe with, a, with, with, the, with not the same level of agency, we may say, as the pressure of capital, but there are actually neighborhood organization activists, uh, groups that have had a certain lifestyle and way of living for many generations and they want to preserve that. I see your plan also as a way to mediate those forces, as a way to somewhat accommodate increased density increased investment while also maintaining, especially in the west side of the neighborhood, a fabric that we imagine will be um, preserving, um, you know, uh, certain social dynamics that uh, would be completely erased if um, the regulation was not in place. So I guess that could be another way of thinking, um, you know, the value of your project is not about a kind of a form-based codes that we want to do because we think it looks pretty, but it's more about, you know, finding a middle ground and a mediation among this will to preserve and will to transform, if you will. You know, can you go back to the perimeter block uh, diagram for a second? So yeah, so this is, I really love this idea that the mechanism for this is reallocating, you know, maximum lot coverage to create an interior block, you know, one of the, so that's so sort of gets you to the spatial configuration, but what's undetermined here is what is the kind of social arrangement for a multi owner interior open space. And, you know, the way that this was achieved in Copenhagen actually was in the, in the, started in the 70s, but really it picked up in the 90s, which was that the city created a program to acquire, um, uh, you know, buildings and structures and incentivize multi-owner groups to remove structures from the mid in the interior of the block, but also create a framework for cooperation among multiple owners that allowed them to maintain this shared open space without those sort of social, um, um, uh, so, so social guidelines in place, these interior courtyard blocks would not have happened. Any new kind of uh, perimeter blocks that are be const being constructed are typically, uh, I think they're, they're, they're usually one owner or one developer. So this idea that you would transition a block with a multi, a multi owner perimeter block is quite interesting. And I think it would be something really neat to explore in terms of uh, the, 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 the plan partial Addendment, but I think it would have to be complemented with some indication of a social structure to accommodate a multi owner shared open space. Guys, it's it's 12 o'clock. Um, so theoretically, I, this is when we're supposed to end. <laughs> can I throw in one more thing about this transitional thing? Just uh, it's literally a 10 second thing. If, if you go back to page 20, I mean, I actually also like these things, the, the, the transitional diagrams, except for this one, right? I think you can go from mid rise to high rise. I think you can go from a high rise to higher rise. But if you go from low rise to low mid rise, you no longer have low rise. Like I, I, a low rise is like a, it's like a smoothie. And if you put mid rise in it, you put a strawberry in it and now it's a strawberry smoothie. You know, it's like, it's just, it, 
this is the one where you go, you either want to keep this one or you want to kiss a goodbye in your town. Right? You, you, can't, you can't have, and it has to do with the scale of perception of small buildings versus everything else, right? Like, like if you have a small neighborhood and you begin to get these medium things in it, it's a sad neighborhood. It's no longer, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a memory of sadness that, that, that it, so I, I think this is the one where you go, you know, either keep it entirely or mm. burn it down. Just, just tear it, the whole thing down. The other ones are fine. You know, like, like these, the, it, it, these are ones that the, I think uh, Gigo is referring sort of to this about this, uh, the, like, what's the question of, of, of but I, I, this is the one drawing in here in your entire set where you're going, like, you guys are thinking like scientists, not like architects, you know, and you're going, this is the one I don't believe. So, so I, I, anyway, that just wanted to throw that in, Dean, before we, we congratulated this team on a really interesting project. Fair enough. That's my favorite metaphor of yours, so I'm happy that it was the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. And thanks, Shelby and Imran. Great work. Thanks. And congratulations, Shelby. Yeah, congrats. Completion. And <laughs> it's the last day of architecture school, but the first day of your uh, career as an architect. The first day of being unemployed. So. Yeah. <laughs> the first, the first official day of unemployment. Shelby, yeah. Anyways. Shelby, congratulations. Imran, I, I thought the project was really, like, I really liked the project. And I thought it was a great project to jump off and do more thinking, you know, like, like um, I mean, I hate to sound like Simon Atkinson. No, now spend an entire summer on it. You know, just, I just think that it's, it's like uh, uh, quite a nice project. To, uh, uh, and it brought up, but, but for me, it, it, it brought up this whole, Kind of underlying desire that, that that like if you look at theory and so much urban theory of the last 50 years it's somehow a way to try to put the genie of late capitalism back in the bottle and no one's figured it out no one's figured it out it, you know only oma that, that's why maneo says that only uh, that only rem Kulas has an actual manifesto that everything else is just a strategy trying to figure out a theory behind it and and, and that's because people won't name with the exception of maybe the new urbanists they won't name the fact that really underlying there is this desire to recapture something that's gone away. And I, I think that, that being really upfront about that and being really clear about that as your intention and then about the limitations that you feel inherently in the mimetic processes of like new urbanism. I think that's this really, really crucial starting point that, that without us putting that on the table, and being honest about it, there's no real chance for progress in this discourse that we're having, or in the discourse that's having in urban planning. I, I just think it's, it's just one of these things that people they skirt around it, but it's just such a central, such a central kind of a, 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 a pressure. You know, it's like a family having a Thanksgiving dinner, and no one's saying what is actually on everyone's mind. Uh, I think I think you have to be be clear about it. But but your project got at it, and I thought it was really great. Thank you. Yeah. Dean, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Enjoy Thank it. you, always. David. Thank really you. appreciated your comments. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you, David. Wow. Thank you, David. Thanks, man. Great appreciate discussion. It. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Nice to meet you guys. Oh. Dean, can we just come back at 1230 or how does that work? Yeah. So um, I'm going to I'm going to leave this open, but I'm going to put up a placeholder, um, meaning I'm going to leave this session open all afternoon um, but the school gave me a placeholder to put up since this is sort of out on youtube right um so it's just a kind of placeholder screen and you know we're supposed to start again at 12 30. uh so yeah just just um you can log off and log back on if you want but i'm going to leave the session cool. in place strong work shelby emerhan thank you guys excellent Thanks everyone this morning for all great work, guys. Yeah. Yes, good, really, really good discussion this morning. Fantastic, and you guys got to very clear, very well developed presentations and work. Uh, I can't believe how much work you've done in the last few weeks. Um, yeah. So really, congratulations! It, it, it's really a pleasure to see how things came together. Yeah, the, the last two weeks of work, it, it's remarkable what you guys did. So um, that's awesome. Thanks, guys. I will right, well, see you guys in a bit. Yeah. Control. Control.
So can you, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me. Uh, okay, so our group is focused on the green infrastructure and basically the in, uh, waterfront and the university. And I will start to introduce the site. Our site is located in the Nueva Leon state and near the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you can see the Rio Grande become the run through the border between Mexico and Texas. And our site is um, on the Santa Catalia River, which is a branch of San Juan and exactly, exactly located on the San Juan River Basin. So we are focused on the climate change, which you can see from this image. This is a tropical hurricane tracks from 1851 to 2015. And our site is the red spot, which you can see is located on the edge of the hurricane pattern. So a lot of um, catastrophe often happens here, like uh, I choose the three major events, the 19 uh, Monterey hurricane and the hurricane Gabriel, and the uh, most recent one is the 2010 hurricane Alex. This hurricane actually causes 59 people to death and with the area reaching up to one meters of wind during the last same period destroying homes, avenues, highways, and infrastructure, and leaving up to 200,000 families without water for a week. And zooming into our site, this is the typography, which you can see all the, all the contour goes to the lower point, which is the uh, waterfront area and the old river plan area. So basically me and my teammate Jomar break down this inundation area into the two major projects. One is the riverfront and another is the old river plan. And next I think Jomar can talk a little bit more to the old river plan. Yep. So here's an image of the uh, Distrito Parisima Alameda and kind of highlighting the river. So the river used to go through the center of this district, but it was covered up um, with large blocks. And so every time it rains, naturally the uh, rainwater drainage just kind of goes to the center of the district where it's lowest. And uh, you can also see a few of those inundation points, but uh, so this kind of caused a conflict and a um, challenge uh, for the district in itself. Uh, Next slide. So one of the proposals is having a green street grid of uh, vegetated infrastructure that intersect and a, um, now this is the general grid. Um, this is to kind of catch and hold water to slow or to slow it down as it goes to the center of the district. Next slide. And so here's another one and I'll, I'll clarify this in a little bit. The second uh, system is what we call like the green ladders. It's kind of a concentrated uh, green streets that focus on the areas that are most prone to flooding and or get off, give off a lot of um, uh, sheet flow or water runoff or uh, rainwater runoff. Uh, next slide. So here is a clarified image of the two green ladder systems. I will be focusing a lot more in detail on the one that is a darker gray. Uh, but these two ladders are to assist in the larger green network and, um, and we'll kind of go into the different types of streets um, or kind of like what this green infrastructure consists of uh, later. Yeah, so right now I would talk firstly about the riverfront regeneration. And first, uh, the section perspective shows the relationship between DPA and the river, which you can see a uh, 10 lay speed one way 
books down the connectivity between DPA and the rivers. So what's worse, uh, when the floating happens, this is a normal water level, uh, and this is a floating level. When floating happens, the water raises up to the highway, and even when the 100-year floating happens, uh, even three blocks will be influenced by the by the floating. So overlay all these problems together. This is the main issue I want to uh, solve. And from this plan, you can see clearly the blocks which will be influenced by the uh, by the hurricane and floating. And this is the DPA relationship to the river. And basically the strategy is to come up with four different uh, ways to, to solve the problem. And the first on the upper river is to purify water. And on the middle river is to connect DPA with waterfront. And on this point, because this is a very seriously inundation point, because the highway is at the lower point, and I want to transform this into a more permeable land to absorb water into the city. And in the, in the lower river, um, the basic idea is to make use of the water and hold, hold the water. So uh, what, I, what I want to do is transform the floating condition like this to this. Uh, so the design process is to, which you can see from the left image, this is the current condition. There are unaccessible and insufficient footbridge so uh, the proposal is to propose a new bridge in the middle of the river. And the second shows the highway condition, which I want to solve. And which you can see the proposal uh, are different strategies to solve the connectivity. Uh, in the middle is a land cover to cover the whole land and connect DPA with the waterfront and along the two bridge are two elevated park and at the upper river um, three pedestrian bridge was proposed because this is a ecological restoration land and I don't want to have so much connection to the downtown. And um, this one shows the unplanned float plan which I want to solve is to transform uh, Almost all of them are transformed into ecological soft edge, but two area, the middle area is the commercial area. I want to create some hard edge for people uh, for recreational reason and the uh, habitat protection reason. And the last shows the insufficient float control facility, which uh, almost along the highway uh, berm will be proposed, but on the wetland parts, um, the wetland will be permeable and absorb water. So overlay all this diagram together, it comes up with this, uh, uh, this whole diagram. This shows a green promenade, which connect, the darker green promenade connect the uh, DPA to the waterfront. And this uh, riverfront was broke down into four different functions, ecological, restoration, civic recreation, commercial wetland, and agricultural reservation. And all the darker green shows are um, green, like green ecological land, and the lighter green bubbles are where programs happen. And this is the final master plan of the riverfront. So at the ecological restoration area, um, include the educational marsh, tide park, wildlife habitats, and the civic recreational area include the bridge park, the football field, state plaza, and facilitator. And the commercial area uh, have a cover which um, include the commercial center, the wheeling deck, the sculpture park, which connect uh, all along into the city with a uh, art plaza. And the wetland have a quick park, wetland park and football plaza. And the lower river are all transformed into agricultural reservation land. 
So this this shows uh, the normal water level. Uh, um, when the when there is no flooding happens, the water mostly will be gathered at the ecological reservation place and the wetland. And when the flooding happens, um, it still have two embankment steps. So the water will be uh, trapped into the first embankment. And when the 100 year flooding happens, some area will be flooded like the uh, Tide Park, the amphitheater and football, uh, football field and the, uh, the other agricultural land will be covered. Um, so it comes to the detailed design strategy. The first site I choose is at the, uh, at the ecological site, which you can see a uh, section cut through here. Mm, basically the idea is to uh, cover the two, oh, cover the three lay of the highway and into a cap and transform it into a recreational place with a, a pedestrian bridge links the downtown area to the to the waterfront and using the uh, float preventing berm to prevent the floating like the orange the orange little thing shows the 100 year floating level this is the highest level and the water will be gathered and um, put into the waterfront. And the program here is also hybrided. The 10 speed, speed highway will be transformed into a program into four hierarchy. The first is the public transportation lay and the slow lay and the fast lay and the metro lay. So, um, and the waterfront is have also three different types of embankment. The highest is the promenade and the biking lay and jogging lay. And lastly is the boardwalk. And the section side I choose is at the uh, commercial area, which I want to connect DPA and waterfront using a cover. So uh, the highway was digged down to ours and um, there is a little ramp to connect the DPA to the waterfront, but the berm still existing and they have two different types of berm. The edge is um, proposed into hard edge because I want some uh, recreational activity happens here. So basically the, the highway still transformed into four hierarchy and there are underground parking under the pavilion. And the program here are still hybrided, but more commercial. Like you can see the red, red log happens. And the last site I choose is at the uh, wetland. So uh, at here, the highway was buried into the earth. And at here, there's no burn because I want to the wetland become a, a place to, for the city to gather water. And the orange orange marker also shows the 100 year foot, uh, flood flows water level. And the, um, basically the highway was transformed into two hierarchy, the uh, low speed light and the fast speed light. And not, uh, not so much program happens here, but the biking lay, the orange lay still connect and uh, boardwalk. So last is a bird view of the waterfront. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. So do we wanna talk about Zoe's specifically or do we want John to present his like we did with the last um, morning session and talk about them both together as part of a, a green infrastructure strategy. I would recommend if we can to, to hear John's mark presentation first so that we have an opportunity to, um, yeah, to talk about both at the same time and make some. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm ready. 
Let's see, I'm going to go ahead and quickly share mine. All right, everybody can see this. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to part two of green infrastructure. So quickly showing the existing condition and the area that I focused on. Uh, this area highlighted was very interesting as it had a number of qualities, challenges, and opportunities of which I'll briefly discuss. For one, it's centrally located with residential on the north side and commercial on the south. Um, it is also significant flood area. As previously shown, uh, there used to be a river running through here that ended up being covered. Uh, the red highlighted portions are properties, buildings that are at least three quarters underwater. So although the river was covered, natural site drainage gathers along these streets, which are the low points of the site. So this is the University, or University of Uere, now one of my favorite places of Monterrey, and it's located right at the center of the district as well. Uh, this create, or this allows the creation of a huge opportunity as educational facilities are great hubs of activity, uh, you know, for a range of diverse functions and people groups. Uh, the one downside, however, the university is very disconnected and quite cumbersome going from one building to the other. Uh, the west side has excessively large blocks, partly used to cover the river. Um, let's see. Oh, lost my cell phone. Ah, there we go. The increased distance um, of these blocks makes it very difficult to navigate and somewhat tiresome to go around, uh, specifically going north and south. Uh, these large blocks and its shape size are, are inconvenient and create underutilized space and shown here, uh, making the space rather difficult for residents and businesses to occupy. You can see these kind of unusual open shapes um, and how like the inside of these blocks, uh, these spaces are mostly vacant. Uh, they're usually either open storage and once in a while you get kind of like a privatized back lawn or nice back lawn to someone's residence. So here are the overlapping uh, challenges and opportunities, which then kind of go into the proposed. The uh, Green Street grid um, was briefly discussed earlier and so creating a system of green infrastructure to catch and absorb and slow down the sheet flow um, to help out with the flooding issues that kind of occur at the center of the district. So here are just three types. Now the streets are at different and vary in widths. So depending on the situation of the street, um, they are allowed one of these three situations, whether the green infrastructure is at the center or in the midst of the street, along the curb or part of the sidewalk. So here cutting the large blocks in half is creating, or I'm proposing creating a pedestrian passageway. Uh, we were informed that it was very difficult to dedicate an existing street to become pedestrian only. Um, like there was a small block that required a lot of political battles to occupy and it was only for a day and it was just one block. So this street, which we are, or that, I, that is being proposed doesn't exist. So it's not a street being taken away from cars. So hopefully it's a little bit more, um, I guess, quote unquote, easier to, to make it um, occur or to make it happen. So I believe this is a big move, not only in attracting interest, but a beginning mind shift into seeing the benefits to a more walkable district. Uh, let's see, next page. So the second part to cutting the blocks is also maximizing the underutilized space inside the blocks. Now opening the space to the public and creating opportunities for various programs and infrastructures can occur. Uh, the other one is connecting the university uh, to dedicate an open space uh, for the students. It can be open to the public during weekends and after hours, but it also creates a unique kind of a central hub space for the university as well. Uh, let's see, this one uh, to the right or to the east of the district is kind of extending a pedestrian only passageway. So to kind of have this continue to the east side and connect to existing activities, transportation systems and businesses. So here is a quick look at the proposed master plan. 
you can see how the blocks are dissected and allow this uh, pedestrian only street path uh, with a series of functions that we will go into detail later and how it carries on to the east side of the district. Uh, so in this kind of image, it just kind of shows uh, how I wanted to create major anchors along this uh, pedestrian path so that you know it takes people from one end to the other comfortably and you pass by a variety of different functions, opportunities, and activities that kind of generate in itself. So here is, I apologize for the various legends or icons, but uh, this is just like indication of how water flows uh, down the street and actually um, a majority of the flooding and damaging of properties where they're three quarters or more underwater occur along the street. So this is just a kind of diagram showing if water does come along this way, uh, you have various, or the street, I think I showed this in another slide or it's supposed to be here. The, um, there's a setback of these buildings that happen gradually. Now this wouldn't happen immediately, but to provide uh, infill or green infrastructure infill to be able to catch more water and to have it drain slowly. And if it over, becomes overwhelmed, maybe the water can be transferred into underground cisterns that are located in the center of these, uh, let's see, uh, these uh, pedestrian community spaces. Uh, so the icons below just kind of show an indication of like uh, the first one being the most, the most relevant to the site, I guess. Like this one has a major water feature and the um, recycling and circulating of water to apply these water features for the public. Let's see, so next slide. Huh. I'm missing a slide, but it's okay. So here's a bunch of different icons and the interpret at one's own risk, but uh, just kind of the different activities and functions that are that can occur. Now there's a lot of possibilities and all of these can be intermixed in its own way. But uh, I also kind of gave little cheesy names of to some of these uh, plazas, but bear with me, I'll, I'll kind of like, uh, provide an indication or the feel of what these plazas can become. But as mentioned earlier, one of the anchors at the end of this, now this is just a large um, manufacturing building. It's like making up shirts or something. So uh, kind of reusing this building and many of these buildings now, uh, some of them are warehouses, some of them are just large envelope buildings, and some of them are existing businesses, which I'll go into later. But uh, this one can be reused for work training center, I imagine, or some kind of uh, job opportunities. And then you have some here that are existing like daycare that kind of transform this uh, one specific plaza to the identity of like a play garden plaza, something for, uh, younger, um, like teenagers, kids, things of that sort. So I'm trying to get a diverse crowd to occupy these spaces through various times of the day. And then anchored on the, um, on the right side here is a extension of the university, additional buildings, which uh, were kind of shown in the previous master plan. So going into kind of the feel, uh, here's Reminis Plaza, again, the large water features, uh, maybe it's recycled water from rainwater that's gathered. Uh, the other thing too is that this site, it's usually very, very dry, hot and humid, or uh, very hot and dry, and then it rains excessively and then it's flooding. So this is a way that when it's raining excessively to collect the rainwater and use it during the dry seasons. So. Here is the Mariachi Stage Plaza. Now, again, I apologize for the cheesy names, but just kind of showing how the underground cistern location and how if it does rain, these, um, these pedestrian um, community spaces can be used as somewhat of like a holding of, of water, like a detention pond, something of the sort, and lots of um, trees, vegetation, water catchments to absorb or hold the water. Um, again, also these buildings along are mixed use. Um, 
it's kind of in the center, as previously mentioned, like the north of it in plan, um, pointing to the north side is very residential and the south side is very commercial. So this kind of green ladder system is almost literally stitching the two uh, residential and commercial together to where this center portion of the district becomes kind of a mixed use and allowing spaces for the public. So that's that. Um, the play garden plaza, again, you can kind of see how it, this is like images and just kind of Photoshop, but a recessed uh, play area that can also hold water. But even if it does hold water, the kids are still able to play on some of the structures. Um, just an R&R &R plaza, not for rest and relaxation, but maybe for rest and revitalization plaza. Uh, then some water steps. This is a, at our mentioned university edition and how it can be kind of like a nice quiet place to, and again, also hold water as well and bring community together. Uh, I realized too later by looking at uh, Rotterdam in Rotterdam, yeah, that they had something similar. If we were to make this guy a little bit wider, we could put a basketball or something in here as well to make this kind of more or to be utilized when it's completely dry, but that's just something. That I'm just throwing out there is also a possibility. So this is the east side of the, uh, oh, and of course the uh, proposed Uere. Um, so again, in previous diagrams, it kind of showed how the buildings are very dispersed and uh, disconnected, uh, creating a center public space allows, and the, the mirroring of buildings allows like a very unique university kind of hub space. Uh, for the district and for the university itself to allow it to expand and really have um, like a, a pretty nice space in the center. But uh, let's see. So again, here's kind of like the water flow. The water actually goes around and floods these areas. Uh, so a lot of kind of park um, or open green spaces are provided to absorb more water. Uh, a lot of these are like a hospital a uh, 10-story parking garage or something. So these are larger buildings, which would be a little bit more difficult to maneuver, to adjust. So um, spaces like this, this was a open um, uh, surface parking. So this is changed into um, like a small little pocket park in a way to help absorb the water. And this one was previously like just a center circular grass field with a monument. So to really um, take advantage of this space to not only absorb the water, but also create a nice uh, community space and a pedestrian pathway to, uh, of various activities um, for the community. Let's see, so also the various uh, different activities to occur or that could occur along these areas. And let's see, and I think that's about it, so. Thank you very much. Nope, I think I lost everybody. <laughs> no, no, we're here, great. Oh, okay, hey, there we go. Exciting, exciting work. I'm trying to find the little part where I can, or a part of the Zoom is missing. I'll see if I can find it later, but yeah, thank you. I'll go to this guy. I apologize. I think that a presentation was too quick. I don't think I don't think so, John Mark. It was just just fine in terms of timing. Thank you. Can I ask a general question? Sure. <clears throat> of the team. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit more specifically when the flooding occurs? Is it just at Is it just a concern with hurricanes? Or is it a concern? Uh, just kind of just give us a little bit more of detail about the flooding events or potentiality. Gotcha. Uh, Zoe, would you like to answer this one or? And I think also. Uh, a year four have some problems. I didn't hear you clearly. Oh, no. OK, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of and Gigo can can uh, chime in, too, because he probably knows more about this than than we do. but. Um, so definitely during hurricane seasons are times whenever it uh, rains and floods excessively. Um, 
other than that, for the most part, uh, I would say it's dry throughout most of the year. And when it does rain, a lot of the water flows down from the surrounding mountains. So you got a lot of sheet flow or water, uh, rainwater drainage going from the mountains to the city. And um, I think for the most part, the Monterey, because it's become more uh, car oriented, uh, there's, there's a lot of paved streets, um, not as much green infrastructure to slow down or absorb the water. So you got a lot of sheet flow that's just kind of going to the river as Zoe was uh, describing or showing that that can quickly go from very relaxed to over flooded in, in, in a short amount of time. And maybe to add to that, I would say to be noticed is that the decision of uh, building two uh, highways, basically, or a highway on both sides of the rivers certainly didn't help the situation. So the, the, the edge of the river is very built and um, that also causes a, a series of, uh, of problems in this regard. Yeah, it's an important question because it it it, uh, it 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 really becomes a driver for what what type of green infrastructure you deploy uh, in 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 your approach, whether it's about actually infiltration or whether it's about uh, storage and detention, and when it happens. I mean, my my understanding is that there's basically like three months out of the year where there's intense rainfall and it's otherwise very dry. And so that sets up some particular challenges for areas which are kind of designated as um, detention and infiltration areas, unless they really have this sort of dual function that during the dry season, they can accommodate certain types of use and during the wet season, they can accommodate other types of use. So in your, just one of my comments about your green infrastructure um, uh, references is that those look like references from Portland uh, and other areas where they have more consistent annual rainfall. And so I think one of the things we, we, we chatted a little bit about was what does it mean to do green infrastructure in the context of this more sort of uh, desert climate where there's a very brief period of intense rain and otherwise very kind of dry, arid, hot climate for the rest of the year. Could you comment on that in terms of your how your green infrastructure approach is adapted to this particular kind of rainfall regimen? <clears throat> sure. Um, I think, now I am not a landscape architect, but um, I do love plants and everything. So I, I think uh, with those examples, it kind of showed how, uh, or kind of like the locations of the green infrastructure could be placed. And uh, especially the one where it's kind of located on the sidewalk. Uh, if it was excessive rain, it could catch it, but maybe also distribute it through to the communities. Now, there's still a lot of, um, like, I don't know the exact details of how that occurs to where if it did rain a lot, it would catch it and distribute it through these cisterns. But uh, the other thing would be too, instead of, I, I guess the plant typologies would would be very important in kind of the differentiation between a more um, like Portland, you said, of a place that, that rains more often versus Monterey or um, dry climates. So maybe it would be different kinds of planting, maybe cactuses, something of that sort. Uh, but but other than that, I, I probably couldn't couldn't say any more. So if I jump in on a couple of points, um, first of all, I wish the two of you had included more of the historical drawings that showed where the original river was, um, instead of just jumping into the flood diagram and like expecting us to know um, where that all came from. Um, and that's research that you guys have already done. Um, so in terms of setting up the, the agenda of the green infrastructure, I do think the kind of analysis of where it floods is important, but I think, you know, the other thing about that, that line that more or less follows John Mark where your project is, 
you know, those blocks and all of that are the result of that historic um, uh, morphological growth of the city over time as a reaction to different you know, uh, plans. Um, so I think you should be more explicit about that. Uh, I know also earlier research that had been done in the studio, I believe Jill did on the plant colonies that exist in this area. Uh, I think, as you just mentioned, I think that would be um, useful to, to sort of discuss as it relates to maybe the characteristics of those green infrastructure ladders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then um, finally, you know, one of the things that I liked about sort of Zoe's potential section um, was talking, was the set of diagrams that showed the different flood stages um, and how the water at different flood stages inundates different landscapes, right? So that's a really interesting question, like what happens when one layer of the river edge um, is dry, you know, for four years, <laughs> and then all of a sudden gets flooded. And, you know, at, I would think that as a landscape architect, one agenda would be to try and use that sort of phenomena um, as a way of setting up different landscape characteristics. Yeah, Zoe, could you zoom back to that sequence where you look at the kind of flood existing uh, river uh, uh, area and then the kind of how it, and then and the 100 year, uh, 100 year flood area, your like ac uh, axons, I guess, are sections of those? Yeah. Well, just I just wanted to I wanted to say that I think this is a really super uh, ambitious collection of um, ideas for for the waterfront, and um, um, I think it's very 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 provocative. And um, uh, to say that I think it's it's great that you've managed to sort of zoom in and focus on a couple of different typological approaches and then sort of push those in terms of how that might be expressed in a particular design design aesthetic. Um, and so uh, um, I think this, this is a very ambitious proposal. Um, this is something I'd love for the more folks from the city of Monterey to see, because I think this really is uh, a very ambitious but um, plausible proposal for shaping the future of that water's edge. In particular, you know, this notion that there's areas where we're going to sort of retreat from the riverfront and allow the water to kind of come in and areas where we're actually going to be building right up to that floodplain edge and actually using, you know, some of that new land we're creating on top of the um, uh, uh, roadway infrastructure as developable area, which, you know, in my thinking, you know, could imply that that's how you sort of think about financing such a major infrastructure investment, right? It's like, you're actually making new developable land by putting this mobility infrastructure underground that could be key to unlocking uh, some kind of framework for public-private partnership to, to potentially finance what, what's undoubtedly gonna be a major kind of infrastructure investment along the water's edge. But I think you've put forth a number of quite interesting uh, different approaches along that edge. And it's not to say that, um, I, I think I, I might have approached it slightly differently in terms of, you know, whether it's a more continuous treatment of one or the other, but I really think it's what useful, what you've done, which is to say, here's a couple of, a number of different plausible ways to address this edge and to kind of provoke thinking in terms of what's possible for addressing the kind of flooding condition and, and, and the waterfront. And I think your diagrams of the master plan that changing over time are great in terms of thinking through what it means to have a, a kind of flexible uh, dynamic urbanism that can adapt to radically different conditions over the course of the year. So I think these are really, really strong uh, uh, drawings and, and you, uh, you put a lot of time and energy into thinking this through and detailing it out. I love the drawing of the highway tunnels with the wetland going over top of them. You know, I don't think, you know, 10 years ago, I think people would look at this and say, there's just no way. No one will ever do that. But actually, that's what we're doing here in San Francisco with the Doyle Drive. We're, we're, we're literally building a land bridge 
over the the connection to the Golden Gate Bridge to allow the expansion of the Chrissy the Chrissy Bay wetland. So what a sort of flipping of mindset in terms of prioritization of values and a radical proposal for uh, you know prioritizing the value of ecological services of uh, of um, wet areas and wetlands um, uh, in a place like this. Same question for me that I asked for John is that how does this particular kind of uh, ecological infrastructure approach adapted to the sort of desert condition? And, you know, will this wetland be sort of like a, a dusty, uh, you know, a, a dusty kind of barren area for nine months out of the year? And then the three months where it's this kind of beautiful uh, water-filled wetland, just some, some, some nuances in terms of the approach regarding this particular rain regimen. But other than, than that comment, I think this is some really provocative uh, and strong and strong work. I think yeah. um, if I can jump in, since we're on the, this particular slide, um, I would agree with, uh, uh, I appreciate the provocative nature of uh, the presentation. Um, I guess the way it was presented was that, and I, I think my biggest um, point would be, I agree with the, the notion, the comment just made about having more continuity. Uh, because the way it was presented, I was interpreting it as there's this solution for this this series of blocks, there's this solution. If you look at the master plan, it sort of proposes that there's a variety of potential solutions where I think that I would prefer to look at them as, you know, continuous options that here's one option and, and there might be some variability on either side of the river, but right now, um, I think it works best if, if you consider it as like what of these options could be more continuous throughout because I'm not sure what, what is really, what would be calibrating them if they're broken out block, block, a series of blocks where this is a solution for this blocks, and this is a solution for these blocks, blah, blah, blah. I think it's an interesting concept to think of it as a more universal sort of solution across the board. And then I think uh, one criticism or comment I would make for both proposals is that I would like to hear more after we you take us through these proposals. I would like to actually sort of reverse it and say, okay, what's the impact beyond the immediate areas? What's the impact to the city as an overall? Because these are significant moves, and I think you can look back and go, okay, we can zoom back out and try to understand how these proposals impact the city overall more. Uh, one thing I will say about um, Zoe's proposals are the one that actually talked more about the berm is I think it's pretty critical to when you use the word berm to think about the negative impacts of berms on rivers and river systems and urban conditions and so if we're berming this part of this particular river what are the implications for the for the ecosystem <clears throat> upriver and downriver because I think there's potential right of impact in that regard and I would want to make sure that I understood those repercussions uh, in particular. I think the, in terms of Zoe's uh, presentation, the ones I found more compelling and most interesting were the ones that indeed buried the, the uh, roadways. Yeah. And I see sort of, um, sort of appropriate those spaces because I start thinking about the roadways and in a flooding condition, those are not gonna be occupied, but they're all of a sudden, can they become like the means of moving water around and things of that nature? So mm. they are double duty in terms of infrastructural move. So I think that, those are more compelling to me in regards to both um, what, you know, before, during, and after these sort of events. And uh, uh, for as John goes, I think my question is similar in regards to, I, I appreciate the comment about specificity of place relative to the sort of green infrastructure moves. And it could be, there's untapped potential looking at it in terms of the specificity of place. Um, you wouldn't treat it the same way as you would in Portland. Um, but what what are the things that would change in that regard? So I think that was a really good comment in that, but I was still interested in the bigger picture in regards to how that green ladder system impacts the city overall to some extent. What does it mean about the place? And, I, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about, again, why not have a universal move across that says it's doing all of every street is doing the same thing in regards to every block is retaining um, rainfall is you know capturing water for the most part they're capturing water but I noticed it seems like not every block was had the notation about uh, rainwater collection and things which I was found kind of curious as to why that wouldn't be 
So maybe it's treated as more of a universal master plan throughout and less specific for a block. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just going to um, say something similar to what Charlton was saying. Um, sorry, I, I think I mean, I, my questions are the river doesn't begin and end in your site. And so they're probably, you're thinking, I, I'm sure I'm, there's more city on either side. So the strategies that you're using to clean, absorb, and hold water are probably strategies that could be implemented, um, not just in your zone, but throughout. So for me, it's that those that's a sort of a series of percentages or gradients rather than chunks of themed sort of uh, like this is the clean water theme or the, uh, the you said pur purify, this is the purify theme, this is the absorb theme, this is the whole theme, but rather mixing them together a little bit more, I think could be very interesting. And I would argue that the connect people theme is, is not a zone, actually the ecological performances sort of go throughout and then the connect people is also in percentages and that one zone would have people in a higher percentage closer to the water, but you're showing that there are all sorts of paths that are meandering throughout these different type of ecological kinds of performances. And so when you're dealing with things like that, I, I'm fascinated by, you know, what does it mean to uh, purify water? What, what does that mean in terms of plants? What, what kind of character is that? What kind of textures? What's the environment? How can I occupy that and actually allow for the performance of the plants or in terms of holding water uh, or absorbing water? All these things, I, I think, begin to create a different type of landscape that in a way is um, tailored to something other than ourselves as people like its sectional quality, its character actually is not just like a, a public space in the city. So that that's exciting to me when I begin to imagine these new types of environments that you're uh, encouraging the public to occupy in varying degrees. For me, it's a very sectional project. I understand this is big and this is sort of more of a master plan, but it would be very interesting to me to look, I know you did sort of the chunky sort of axon kind of sections, but to actually look at the profile of the river and think about its edges, I think would be really fascinating. Um, John, I think I have similar questions. I think for you not to have a sense of the, the plants that are there or maybe the capacity of rainfall, like how big these things might need to be um, when it's not a consistent amount of small rain, it's big, big amounts of rain. I, I actually think that's a real opportunity for design and again to think about how the water begins to shape the spaces and so I, I you know, I, you in a way have defined the spaces through um, the people's uses and, the, and I would think about more of a 50-50 split, what, you know, is that a low area that needs more water retention or holding of water before it moves on and what does that mean in terms of use, so really pushing again, the performance of it. Um, and I, I think the, for you, that project, you said you're not a landscape architect, which is great. Um, but as a designer, <laughs> in some, in some regards, I, you know, I couldn't imagine not sketching out um, profiles or moments or really thinking about um, some of those, the character, the surfaces that I'm walking on, or the bridges, you know, does the ground get cut to receive water in a way that it hadn't been done before? Do I reveal the cistern in some way? Is there a sense that there's a cistern there? Um, all of these I find really very exciting. I think those are key points because I think you 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 are you have some key information which was just imparted um, regarding this is seasonal rain. It's, there's a predictability to when the heavy rains happen, and I think for both cases, experientially, the reality of that, like, and how does one inhabit these places during those points, and how does a system and your system behave during those points versus when it's dry, which is the majority of the time. And I think that um, it's a little thing, but um, as you're working through concepts, if you're, like, I have no idea what the condition of the river is and normally, but you know, is it blue water? 
is it like what we're imagining when you're diagramming these things? Because I think you, when you start diagramming things like, like, okay, well, I'm assuming that there's going to be a rain driven water feature here, or I'm going to assume that this, this is going to happen and there's going to be this sort of very nice beach condition and whatever. Um, that very well may or may not be true, but you really should make sure that you have a sense of the reality of experience because there's a reality during the flood, uh, flood period that is, is fairly nasty. And we can imagine that it's going to be blue water um, that's moving up and up and through the system, but there, it's going to be muddy. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be, and I think it's important to, to embrace that, to say, okay, after a flood event, you know, how does, what's the healing process? And what's, and then even when it's not flooding, what's the experience of being for three months when it's really rainy versus nine months when it's really dry? And so it does seem like really small things, but they're actually very significant in regards to understanding and the, the builds upon what Nicole was saying, the experience of place. Just, I guess all ec excellent comments. And, and uh, just wanted to say, uh, actually, John, could you pull up your diagram for a second, the kind of overall plan? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, both yeah, Nicole and Char Charlton are picking up on the fact that these, as a, as a sort of hydrologic system, you know, these moves of necessity are larger than our site. And I so I appreciate that both of you actually have reached beyond the sort of site boundary as we define it and say, well, actually this system's bigger. And so I need to reach beyond the sort of frame you presented for me in terms of, you know, my, my proposal. Um, one thing I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking for is like, well, where's actually the watershed boundary between the water that's flowing toward the river and that which is flowing towards the, um, towards the buried river. I wasn't clear like what the watershed boundaries are. That's sort of a, a detail thing. I'm maybe I'm geeking out on in terms of like watershed boundaries. But what I, what I lo love about the, your proposal, uh, John, is that it, 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 it implies this network that this um, buried river becomes a driver for a new sort of urban form ecosystem driven approach that links through the neighborhood all the way to the macro plaza and takes advantage of some spaces that haven't been thought through in terms of their capability to provide these kind of ecosystem services um, to become a kind of macro organizing uh, a framework for, for, for the neighborhood. So I, re I really like that part of it. I think, you know, because, because I see that as the main move, I think for me, I would love to see your sort of landscape gesture be the foreground and the mm -hmm. kind of building massing and stuff sort of recede. And then my, the third thing I'm hoping for, maybe we can get to this in the publication is that for you guys to merge your master plans, because I'd love to see your ecological infrastructure, east-west spine, and the river spine, and what that sets up and implies, as, as Charlton referred to as, what are the benefits for the entire city mm. to have these two new major uh, kind of green infrastructure elements now introduced into our historic city center? Really quite provocative. Um, so compliment you both on thinking outside the site boundary to really address what is a, a kind of larger um, hydrologic system uh, uh, problem and challenge for Monterey. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can see this becoming part of a, a sort of a policy document, right? That is a template to be, to be used across the city in both cases. Yeah, I mean, for John, I think one of the strengths of your uh, proposal is that you are sort of hinting at things that are currently unseen, as I think you probably described it. I mean, if someone knew why there are bigger blocks than normal, then maybe it would sort of tell us a history of the river that was. But um, I think I think that's, you know, that's very exciting to me and how you can begin to make these design interventions speak. Um, and so that for me goes into sort of the public realm and and meaning, um, and then there's the, also the, the necessity for performance, but that the, the performance, not as a social performance, but sort of uh, water performance, how you wanna address that. And then how those actually work together is, is pretty exciting to me. Thank you. I mean, one question to me has to do with, let's say, you know, the relationship between how such a system might operate 
across the entire sort of flank of the river as it, you know, bisects the city, right? Versus um, how it might operate, let's say, um, semantically as something that it is an identifier for this particular district. Like you go into the DPA and it's known because it has this sort of lush green infrastructure, um, which you know may have evolved as a result of some sort of strategic response to you know flooding in an underground river. Um, and it would be interesting, I think, to see what happens. I don't think we quite got there, but you know, if you took sort of this, let's call it green ladder, green infrastructure system, superimposed it with um, you know the street section typologies. Mm -hmm. uh, which we saw earlier today. And, you know, maybe there's a real idea about developing some sort of, you know, psychogeographic um, form for the urban space that sort of says, this is a really special district in the city. Mm -hmm. A lot of terrific comments. And uh, I think, you know, so many points have been covered. So. I'm conscious of time. I just want to uh, make a, a one more comment. Something that I haven't heard is um, maybe next step for you guys um, in order to kind of think about this great work that you have done would be to think how you would connect with the community actually for, for projects of this nature. Uh, in the case of the riverfront, you know, uh, it makes sense that we tackle project with this very high level, top down, if you will, approach. Um, there's no residences that are coming very close to the edge. Um, and then, you know, the kind of infrastructural nature of what's happening along the river kind of requires it. Uh, in the case of Angel Mark, it's a little different, right? I really love, you know, what you're doing by, you know, delighting the water and, 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 and creating this new infrastructure. It is also a place of, of recreation. But um, I think next step would be really think about how you could do something like that while connecting with the community that actually lives there, right? There's a lot of homes, uh, uh, residences, uh, little shops, uh, stores, the local economy. And um, I think we still, to, uh, we still have to find a way to reconcile a project like yours with, with, with all of those things. So some of the names that you give to those plazas, like you know, the Mariachi Plaza, which by the way is, um, um, you know, uh, <laughs> In, in misspelled in more than one way. Uh, oh gosh. Um, Never mind, I won't go to it. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe that was your attempt to say, and this will be owned by the community. Um, so that's one way, but because so much work may uh, be necessary in order to really bridge in with the community from your position, maybe it's better to think that you're providing this flexible framework, you're providing these design solutions, but there is a way for the community really to then make some decisions on how this will be happening. So the position of those little plazas, the way in which you know, it connects with specific properties that have owners and have economic activities that they're running and so forth, we need, you know, the next step would be a way to kind of let the community take ownership of this great project and 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 being able to implement it while also adapting it um, to their very specific specific needs, so that they can choose the name of that plaza. I don't think they would choose Mariachi Plaza as a name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But really, really great work. I also want to acknowledge that um, we have with us now Ruth Ferreira, um, urban designer, architect from, from Gal San Francisco. Uh, she also briefly um, connected with the students throughout the semesters uh, as she's working on a large uh, master planning project in the DPA together with other members of our team. Um, so we, we thought it was a great idea to, to have her among our, our reviewers. So hi, Ruth. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Hello. So just in time for us to start the next project. <laughs> Excellent.
I guess that's mine and Chang's cue to get started. Um, let me just is. let me just pull up my screen, and we can share window view full screen. Is Chang on? I don't want to start it unless he's on. He should be. Uh, hey, hi everyone. I'm Chang. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm Caitlin, and that's my lovely partner, Chang. Okay, so our particular project was um, focused on kind of developing the public space um, strategy for the DPA. And so it really revolved around this idea of urban acupuncture, that the public space could be built around like using these specific small moments um, to create a larger kind of chain reaction that then interconnect and create this great network of space for people to use. And so that's kind of where we're going. We're going to present our strategy to you. And then we kind of took our strategy and a, a few of the parcels we had identified that we thought would be good for intervention and actually designed some interventions. So we're going to see strategy, then some examples of what our interventions are. So just kind of starting out with the DPA, these are some photos from our site visit. And the first thing that you see is just concrete everywhere. The big thing that we noticed when we were walking around is it's really kind of pedestrian unfriendly. Um, you know, you can kind of see in this middle top photo that the cars are literally inches from you with no barriers and those cars are going like between 40 and 50 miles an hour. The sidewalks are super narrow. I could barely fit on some of them. And just there's not really spaces for people to go to except the really large Alameda Park or the really large Parisima. Other than that, you're kind of like stuck. So that's what really kind of stood out to us was this lack of space and this lack of kind of pedestrian connection among the spaces. So we kind of began to analyze where are the social spaces in the district? You know, people are still here, they're still hanging out, where are they going? We did this through an intersection analysis, and so those are kind of the blue dots you're seeing, and an analysis of where informal markets are, because the markets can set up anywhere, they're gonna set up where people are. So the blue kind of shows how activated those intersections are based on the number of storefronts on them. The larger the dot, the more people, and the purple is where the informal markets are concentrated. So we kind of see there's this almost isolation of all social life happening in the north and kind of northeastern parts. And then you can see the parks, which I use that term loosely except for Alameda, are kind of scattered and not really well connected. They're barely touching one another with their um, walking sheds. And so it really becomes difficult to interconnect these things because Yet again, the streets are not friendly for pedestrians. So then we kind of tried to figure out why is this happening? And so we looked at what we call disruptions in the road of you're seeing all these roads, especially in that Southern part where we see a lack of kind of the social interaction, um, roads are jogging, they're not meeting up. Um, and so we began to identify as like, okay, these are some places we can maybe do something because you need to create this comprehensive network. And so the big question became is, how can we activate this district through a series of connected small interventions? So how do we take this kind of disjointed, unpedestrian friendly space and create this comprehensive public network space um, that we can insert little things? So first we identify the various scales because with urban acupuncture, that concept, it can be from as small as a bench to as large as a whole park design. So the idea of a larger community space those disruption spaces at where those roads are jogging. And even in the intersections, how can we redesign those to make them more pedestrian friendly? So we kind of developed a general strategies for the district. We identified potential sites of intervention and then selected sites, um, the selected sites from that. And then we define the unique types of public space. It's kind of our strategy to try and get to this final image. So that starts with, um, y'all weren't here for the first presentation, but in our mobility thing, um, Jill had identified types of streets based on the use of um, the program use of the area. So you kind of have a residential area, a university core, a riverfront, a commercial, and an infrastructural core right here down the middle where those main highways are located. And so each of these kind of have different characters. You know, one is busy, there's a lot of temporary people versus residential, they stay there long term, um, things like that. So kind of creating general interventions for spaces, environment, transit, safety, and events 
that could happen in each of these unique, we call them subdistricts. Then going from there, we identified what we called underutilized parcels. Um, and that was parking spaces, park or plaza spaces, vacant spaces and wasteland. Um, so everything you see highlighted, we believe is a potential site where you could intervene um, because it's either abandoned, it's forgotten, um, there's an overabundance of it and things like that. And each of them come with their unique, with their unique issues. So in vacancy, it'd be like ownership, is there historical importance, um, existing structures, park, um, yet again, historical importance, what program exists there, um, is it comfortable to sit in, things like that. Parking, is it necessary to have that parking? Can we get rid of it? Um, do we need to preserve part of it? Wasteland, um, the big thing on that one was pollution. You know, if we're gonna develop on a wasteland thing, how do you mitigate the pollution? So this is kind of how we began to identify what specific parcels we need. We pulled out all the parks and plazas and created the, sh the pedestrian walking sheds. And you can see very clear gaps clear gaps in those northwestern and southeastern spots. We then overlaid um, John Marks and Zoe's green infrastructure and parks plans because this is a part of the public space thing. They're just larger infrastructural moves. And from there, we selected parcels that kind of finished out that pedestrian shed. So wherever you are, you're within a five minute walking distance of a larger community public space area. So that's kind of how we selected these larger parcels um, for potential intervention. And then Cheng? Yeah, so I will talk about other potential places for intervention. And uh, there are a lot of special spaces in BPI. Uh, you can see the yellow circle, it's uh, disruptions uh, happened with end of road and they are facing the building facade and cars will stop at each intersection and people will slow down at this area. Also, you can see there are a lot of disruption moments focused on the Cinco de Maya. Since this is an important boundary between the two different types of blocks, so the blocks shift a little bit, so there will create a lot of disruptions. And then about another special space, the intersections. I start from to evaluate the value of each intersections and I create four assessment index of intersections. The first one is the number of active corner shops. I mark out the corner with more than three shops and the same as unused open space, the high quality buildings, and the crosswalk infrastructures. So I overlay these four elements to this one intersection mapping. And, uh, and the, the highlight one is with more potential developing volume. And then uh, next. There you go. <laughs> okay. So I start facing one is intervening in these intersections with the higher values. Also, uh, intervening the single demand as a bridge to, as a bridge for the south and and east. Next, and phase two with further development, and we can intervene the other intersection and disruptions and create the linkaging between them and also link to the proposed green infrastructures, the community space. Yeah. And the base on the three scales of basis, we provide these general strategies for each type. And you can see the middle circle is the expectations for each type and the other circle is the detail tactics we can apply to use in our detailed design. Okay. So now we will have some examples to show these three types, how we intervene in them. So firstly, the disruptions. And in each type, we have two detailed designs. 
And so I start from the subregion analysis also happening in Cinco de Maya and this portion. Uh, first, first stage, I reshaping the edge of the disruptions and then connect, connecting to the surrounding public realms like parking lots, uh, vacant land, uh, the existing parking parks. Also, stage three, accommodating the systematic programs. I imagine think Maya can be more livable and uh, multifunctional street. So zooming my site, you can see since the little bit shift. So when you stand on the street, you can have the view of the building facade. And the orange one is good since it's a popular bakery frontage. And the dark one is a um, factory office. It's unwelcome facade, close the window, close doors. So go to my structure to this site. Firstly, I organize the circulation, change the scenic demand to two ways, also add bike line, and then lay overlay the pedestrian crossway. And you can see the central area of the road. I create an orange pattern for this shared space for pedestrian, for bicycles, for car that will use special materials to slow down the car or save for vehicles. Also, there are some existing stores. We can uh, link them to this whole street. Also link the existing unused open space to serve it for the bakery or taco use or for the free market. Also, add some decorations for the pavement to match the facade or identify the corner space for people to use play and reading. So this is the people's view, how we change it. And uh, we extension the sidewalk, add some park for the vendors and people can stay and talk to the corner. Also use that shared pavement to cross the street and add the bike lines. And next. So this act sounds can, more, can show more clearly about what happened with people's daily life. And uh, can see the uh, colorful facade matched with new pavement. So people can stay here, take some photos. And the green wall, people can stay here, watch some flowers, or so the parking for vendors with some chairs, tables, shelters, and some open space for bakeries. People can use outdoor chairs and so on. And the next disruption um, we did was this one that's in the southwest um, quadrant. Um, it, it's called the La Parisima because it is um, just a few blocks west of it. Um, it's kind of where, where the roads begin to converge around the um, church, the La Parisima. And so kind of the strategy with this one is this is an existing photo. Um, Yet again, very car dominated. People can't really walk safely. Like this woman's literally walking in the middle of the street. So how do we take these existing assets? The, um, there's two schools here. There's a government building. Um, this is a brand new office building with some existing ground floor commercial. And then this is a vacant building. So kind of these four parcels and this underutilized um, weird walkway that's pictured to the left. Um, how do you kind of create this connected social experience with the idea that it is located in what we've identified as the Riverside subdistrict? So the idea of we want to focus on um, permeable pavers, gathering points, thermal comfort, biking and pedestrian, and um, some sort of bioswale to help mitigate that flooding that we know will come. And so when we look at the site plan, these parcels that have the pink around it are the specific vacant parcels of taking those since there's existing buildings, um, somehow 
getting small businesses to come in and creating a small like cafe gathering point that would service both the school and the government building. Um, instead of having currently as existing, this is all parking in front of the um, buildings here, um, creating outdoor seating spaces for here. And most importantly, the biggest transformation in this disruption would be the um, I'm going to the pedestrianizing. I don't know if that's a word. I'm just going to make it up um, of this particular road to where cars can get through if they need to, but it's really oriented towards people being able to walk on that road. You can have a food truck park um, and then increasing the number of trees for thermal comfort, kind of reducing how much heat you're getting from that concrete and adding um, these yellow lines or bike lines and things like that. And so kind of the before and after you get more people out, you have a lot of beautiful trees, it's shaded, people can bike places now instead of having to drive everywhere. And you just see a reduction of cars on the road. And um, looking overall at kind of the axon of how it is, is it becomes a lot more lively. You have people out. Um, it is servicing just to the, well, just to the top of this photo, there's a neighborhood. So now people have a place to come with their children and just sit out and enjoy the day. So kind of we can reimagine this little disruption with these vacant buildings as becoming a much more lively pedestrian oriented space. So then the next place, the next intervention we have are in our intersections. Um, so really thinking about how are those roads meeting and how is it affecting the pedestrian experience um, and how can we enhance it? So this one is located just to the east of the site um, right here. And it actually is part of an existing pedestrian road. Um, this particular intersection dead ends the pedestrian road that exists along this top edge. Um, and so it became really interesting because you weren't just seeing a car intersection, you're really seeing the intersection of people who dominate to suddenly there's no way they can even walk. And so yet again, looking, um, you can see it's completely car dominated. That's the pedestrian space right there. It ends there and then you have very narrow sidewalks. There's not even crosswalks for you to safely cross. And thinking of the strategy of how do we extend this pedestrian road for people to be able to continue walking. This particular road leads to um, the new Riverside Park that's always designing and to a very popular hotel and mall that are already existing there. And there's small existing commercial that you can see in this photo um, that would benefit from being able to have that foot traffic because people want to go to the river because it's going to be beautiful. And it's within the same subdistrict as the other one was. So similar concerns. So looking at the plan, um, the big move becoming is these roads get much narrower, narrower to kind of shorten the crossing for pedestrians. Um, you get kind of a uniform paving to define where people are and you add um, ballards or just like those, those concrete posts that are like waist height to kind of stop cars from going into the pedestrian space, really creating that firm border, but people can still cross through it. And creating like this pedestrian space where people can stop, you can host informal markets, um, you can include a micro mobility, um, like a bike sharing dock or something like that. And this pedestrian road, which if a car has to get down it, it can but yet again, dominated by pedestrians that people can sit there um, and enjoy stuff from the commercial area. You could set up small tents um, on the weekend if you're having a farmer's market or something like that, that this becomes, this little intersection really becomes about getting people where they wanna be rather than getting cars where they wanna be. And then this is kind of the before and after, yet again, seeing that people are out, they're walking about, they can sit and enjoy the shade, it's a lot more comfortable and the car becomes secondary to the people. And then looking overall, um, you can kind of really see the height on these buildings. This is um, a hotel, I believe. This is a very large office building, but people can very safely get across and just enjoy this whole experience rather than kind of being shoved around and fearing for their lives as, car, as cars rush by. Okay. And this intersection happened at the northeast corner of the Alameda Plaza, and it was combined with the two street with one way. And I think this intersection play an essential role to connect with surrounding areas and welcome people, welcome people to this park 
also linked to the commercial corridor. And zooming in the site condition, there are a lot of issues. We can see it's not safe for people to cross the rush road with pipelines. And there are some fences and walls at the corner. It's hard for people to stay and to wait in the traffic light. Next one. Yeah. So my strategy, firstly, shrinking the road space, also extension the sidewalk, and uh, providing the shortest crossway, also pavement the central area for shared space, also, and then we programmed the four corner spaces with different functions. Um, and you can see, um, so there are some existing restaurants. I help out with some outdoor eating areas. Also, identify the each corner, like for the disco commercial or the corner of the park, with some new program like the water pool, the planting bed, the benches for people to stay longer. The next. So this people's view to show how we change it. And uh, this more safe pedestrian pavement and at the blue line is the pedestrian median for people to cross the street. Also extension the curb area for people to stay or, and remove the big wall, change it to the bench with flowers. So this axon can see how the people use each corner areas and how they move from the crosswalks and we program with some new functions here, the vendors, tacos and shelter for people and some bicycle rocks, a bus stop like that. Okay. So the final space, which is really kind of the largest of three spaces are our community spaces. So these are much more gathering points for that particular region to kind of come together, hang out, really meant for all ages um, and kind of catering to the specific sub-districts we had identified. Um, so going from there, the particular piece I developed is actually a historic plaza. Um, it is the plaza for so it says it's a school, but when you read the descriptions, it's actually more of a cultural arts center that it um, really celebrates. It specifically talks about like collegiate arts of all types. Um, so they host art galleries and performances and things like that. So it's really this art center located in the middle of the commercial district where you have those more temporary people because they work there, but live somewhere else kind of going through. That's the context of this plaza. And so when you look at it currently in the photo in the bottom left, it's literally a field of concrete. Um, there's not a lot of programming on it. They really only have these lights. Um, I have seen some photos to where I think they added very thin layers of um, grass in certain areas, but there's no shade. So it's not comfortable to sit in it. There's nothing happening there. Um, so that's kind of the big issue you have. So kind of the idea for this site is you have this already existing informal commercial spine where markets set up on literally every day. And so people will cross right in front of this building all the time. So you have this built-in pedestrian connection. And to the east is one of the, um, sorry, is one of the larger avenues we have on the site. And it has bus lines and bike lines and it um, helps services the micromobility system that one of our previous groups was suggesting to implement. That's what these red dashed lines are. And so the idea that this is a cultural arts center, how do you create a stage out of this? That people will come here because there are performances and things to see, but also it's a place to sit and relax and kind of escape from the craziness of the city um, and making it a safe place. So looking at the plan I've developed here, in the middle, it would be completely open. You could set up tents as I have represented in the site plan for 
a weekend market to kind of activate the space. And then um, these kind of colorful triangles would be um, tensile shading structures. This sits on top of the underground parking garage. So there's very limited opportunities to use things like trees um, because there's just not the structural strength. So using some sort of artificial shading structure to cover what you see on the south side seating areas for people who are walking and they've been shopping all day. So they just need to sit down for a moment or the students or people attending events here. And then off to the sides, you get, I'm gonna call it kind of an artificial forest of just planter boxes with very tiny trees um, to kind of create this buffer from the city. So it feels like a bit of a retreat because you have this larger buffer between you and the um, road. And then on the east side, um, creating you know spaces for the buses to come by and ways for people to cross across. Um, there's a new commercial shopping center. So there's a large connection there for people to go. So kind of developing that to create safety and a variety of activities that both passively and actively would happen throughout the day. And so before and after, before it's literally a sea of concrete and after you have these layers of activities from people sitting to people watching an event going on in the center. You have those more tree shady areas off to the side. You know, if you just want to see a tree or hear a bird chirp. And so you actually have people there instead of just people trying to run across as you can see in the photo. And so looking overall, this is kind of what it would be like of people gathering for special events or people sheltering for shade keeping that existing pedestrian and formal commercial thing, that's a lot of words, um, because it's something people use and love and you can begin to create a relationship and formalize that in a way of, yeah, you can have this here, but we're gonna set structures and things for that. So then this becomes a really active place. It becomes a hub of if you're just catching a bus because you're trying to get home, you may be enticed to come and stay a while because you hear tango music or something, or you see some cool lights that are going on for a performance. It's kind of the space becomes this really cultural hub in the commercial area. So this place located on the northwest corner of the neighborhood area. And firstly, I analyzed the village walking circle area. And this area don't have enough program to support the communities together. So I imagine this place can be the community center. So with multi-functions and zoom in the site condition. And there are big wasted uh, warehouse building as well old facade and uh, underused open space. Also the boundary, and uh, you can see the red line is a continuous fence. It's hard for people coming to this block and the orange historic war with some value for local spirit. And the strategy is layer by layer. So firstly, organize the ground level and open the boundary with more entries from the east side. Also add some green space and some bicycle parking point and then the Reprogram the first floor with archive, libraries, galleries, gym, taco, coffee, and retail. And the second floor relinked by the stairs from outside of the building. And uh, there will be the office, meeting, and theater. And the top roof we used for the roof bar and urban form. So you can see the plan merge the straight space with a block edge and uh, it's easy for people come to the site and get into the building. Next one. So this human beings view, we can see, remove the fence and uh, place a soccer field for children's and the uh, safe pedestrian walkway and mm, decorate the historical wall for visitors also reuse that little building for cafe and also add some roof bar. Okay. 
Okay, this axons to show the relationship with surrounding boundaries or so how people can move from ground level to the second level to the top floor and the people can add straight to see what happened in the building and the people also can stand on the roof to see what happened in surrounding neighborhoods. So this can be the social and community hub for the neighborhood. And so those are all the examples we had time to design. And, you know, kind of just, this is an idea of how you can use this idea of just inserting these spaces from a small space to a more large space and a variety of spaces to kind of begin to build out this larger framework of the public space network for the future of the DPA. Um, yeah, that's what we got. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm gonna jump in quickly. Um, I'm really impressed with how you analyzed the city and thought about flows and interruptions and the potential of public space. And I, I think it's really um, it's well researched, but also quite sensitive to things that are often unnoticed. Um, so I, I, I think it's very successful in that sense. And I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I, it's very ambitious, especially in the sense that I think both of you uh, wanted to tackle every single site and, and design it. I, the only comment that I would have is I would ask you to reconsider how you imagine um, design in, in, in a project like this, a more infrastructural project in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I would you might think about your design as not being as being a catalog of elements um, that are deployed in different ways um, in very in varied spots within the city. I think it's sort of there, um, but one of those elements, like for example, the Ballard, the you know how you stop traffic. Maybe that's not something that's purchased, but it actually is an idea of design itself. And I know that's a really small scale that you probably didn't have time to consider. <laughs> but I, in the same way that you catalog the city, I would love to see you catalog the interventions mm -hmm. and then think about how those are deployed. So then when you select the sites, there's in a way a, a test, um, but you could imagine your design continuing to unfold across the city. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit more of almost a how to a how to manual, you know, like um, than it is a one off design. Um, but really, I'm I'm very impressed with the work, and I, I'm I'm pretty excited about its potential. Thank you. That means a lot. Yeah, guys. I just I just want to say um, I think commend you on the amount of work that you guys have done. Uh, just from the, in the last week, uh, let alone two weeks, but from what we've seen, uh, this is an incredible amount of work. I think you guys uh, presented it very co cohesively and confidently. I want to commend you on your presentation skills. That was a, a very, very well organized. And um, so there's so much here to dive into. It's hard, hard to really pick out where to start because there's just so much good stuff here. <laughs> but I just, before we kind of dive into it, I just want to um, commend you on the, the uh, working well together as a team the uh, amount of work you've produced and the quality of it um, and, and your presentation skills. Nice work, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'll add some comments to that. Uh, I thought that was a very enjoyable presentation. Uh, I enjoyed the graphics too. Um, I thought your framing was really, was really good. Uh, perhaps this was covered at another session, but I would encourage you to spend a little more time on the uh, site observations. I think what you said um, that was 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 great, but the images weren't perhaps annotated. Um, so if if you weren't there to explain the work, it wouldn't be speaking for itself. So mm -hmm. I would I would encourage just a little more uh, kind of guiding the viewer through like the things you said um, orally. Just add them on to the to the photos through kind of small annotations. I thought the social space analysis and kind of how you selected the site. The sites was really interesting. Your kind of little mapping exercises to get 
helped you to identify what were the kind of interventions locations more appropriate for those interventions. I would have loved to see a little more unpacking on that as well. I thought those graphics were very compelling, but maybe you could have just spent a little more time on 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 the whys there. Um, and then the projects, I completely agree with Nicole uh, about, I was going to say the same thing. I thought like a kind of kit of parts approach to the design um, would be great. I, I'm impressed that you, ha you had the time to design six interventions um, but in, in the kind of true sense of, of kind of acupuncture, it's sort of about being economic with the resources and this idea of cataloging and, and the kit of parts, I think, would, would fit in very well with, with your approach. So maybe look at some of those examples of, uh, I mean, John's on the call, but for example, the San Francisco Parklets um, manual is a good example of kind of do's and don'ts and, and kind of ideas of how to approach small spaces and um, um, yeah, I think that's that's a, a an interesting um, kind of policy document that you might that is also very visual and very inspiring to look at. Uh, and I thought the 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 three D axons and your little kind of vignettes and 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 streets and eye level views were really great. I really enjoyed that. They were kind of playful, but they were accurate enough. Um, so well done on those. I think they were great. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll pick up on that. I, I think that the um, I, I applaud you on the amount of work and the depth of the work, uh, in particular the, the upfront work, the research. And um, I think that you gave us truly a, a sense of uh, what the place is like, what the issues are, are, and um, and how you sort of methodically are considering them. Uh, I found myself writing questions and then scratching them off because you weren't answering them. In the next slide. <laughs> so, hurrah. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to also emphasize that I think it's really important that you consider at all scales. Um, often we hear that as sort of a, you know, students will say that, but then they, they clearly they move on to the big sort of the juicy bits and sort of forget about the small scale things and the power of those small scale interventions, which I think that I'm, I'm growing more and more to appreciate. Uh, in the situation we're in now, the power of sort of uh, small interventions or small sort of uh, things that we engage on a day-to-day -day basis that, um, so it is important to be able to have a place to sit on a corner or something that might get unnoticed for a lot, with the spotlight being on a grander gesture. So I really love the fact that you looked at these varying sort of in senses of engagement at varying scales and that you didn't get too wrapped up into like the bigger sort of parts that we typically look at. Um, you know, and there are some, some questions that I have that I think, I think I, I totally agree with the kid apart strategy in that regard, because I think you can have this glossary that you can apply and you can make decisions based upon what might be appropriate for that corner that might not be appropriate for that corner. <laughs> but I think that this is all set up by the fact that you dug in and really sought to understand the place and understand the issues and understand sort of like, yeah, let's analyze this, the systems and let's analyze the disruptions and start think, using sort of a way to categorize uh, where we can intervene and things of that nature. So I think it was set up for success from the get go and, for, and by your, I think the fact that you've pushed through as opposed to as opposed to jumping ahead, I guess. I think that I think that shows through and you put it all together in a very nice compelling package. So I really appreciate the fact that consistency across the board from start to finish. Even I love the first slide even. I was sort of like I was like juicy. Yes. <laughs> so I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, you know, there's some, some fundamental basic questions that really have to do with sort of like, for instance, like the 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 plaza that's on the bottom left. Um, that we were talking about earlier. I, I was looking at that and I was thinking to myself, well, there's parking beneath there, I believe you said. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure like the, why not rip out a lot of the hardscape or, and, and apply sort of more sort of grass or things of that nature, something softer. And uh, you mentioned something about small trees and I was kind of going like, yeah, you know, I, I think you go all in. I mean, it's like, yeah, small trees, you go big. And uh, you gave us, the freedom to think about those sort of things on that scale because of the thoroughness of your investigation. So, you know, it's really not a, a criticism. It's just sort of like, yeah, there's some interesting questions there. And there might be a, I know there's other 
potential interventions that actually could be the softer landscapes. And, this, and so it's really a kind of a treat to be able to have that sort of ability to say, yeah, you're giving us a lot of resources. So uh, for us to imagine the impact of, of these interventions across the landscape, which is going to impact a large number of people, as opposed to saying, here's a singular intervention here, is a grander gesture here. So I, I kind of like the fact that um, I could turn a corner and just have a nice moment um, that is that is, is, is calibrated towards that presence. So great job, guys. Thank you so, so two much. Or three com two or three comments from me. The first relates to this last sort of plaza Charlton was talking about, you know, could you be more aggressive, let's say, with the idea that there's an underground parking garage here. And, you know, one of the issues, and, you know, so one thinks about the Schoberg Plain in Rotterdam, which is also, which has sort of pieces of architecture that actually go down and penetrate into the parking garage. And then the other piece of underground parking garages, which I think are very important, are the ways in which people get into and get out of the underground parking garage as a way of activating the public space, right? So where are those thresholds between the section of the parking garage, how people are going down in or coming out of the parking garage and entering the public space. So it becomes a kind of, you know, uh, stitch between, you know, two different modes of, you know, uh, mobility uh, in the district. Your drawings remind me a little bit of a conversation I had 30 years ago with Charles Moore standing on a hill in Guanajuato when he said, oh, this whole city used to be white and then some paint salesman came in and now it's all kind of, you know, polychromy, right? Uh, which is really fun, really, I think, interesting. Um, so that just put that one out there. The one comment that I have sort of architecturally, which is unfair because it's sort of, you know, it goes past what you guys have done, um, has to do with the relationship between your interventions, right? Your kind of the idea of acupuncture, right? Which in your analysis comes out of uh, sort of early drawings of, well, there's some interesting things over here, but there's stuff missing over there, right? So therefore we're gonna look at a kind of more equitable distribution of public interventions in certain locations in order to be more distributive of the way in which the life of the city kind of spreads out sort of throughout the district and it does it in these different ways. I think that's really interesting. For me, the question is to what degree does acupuncture become a catalyst for the next thing, right? Which is to say, you know, like, like the plazas in Gracia, right? In Barcelona, like, okay, we'll go make that public plaza, we'll invest in the public plaza. But the effect of that is mm -hmm. that all the buildings around it start to kind of redevelop and are catalyzed by the, that particular intervention. So for me, the real question would be, what if you took these and sort of mapped them against Shelby and Enrahan's earlier sort of stuff about what the kind of zoning um, opportunities are? Because I suspect that actually what would happen in cases like this is these actually become ways of localizing investment, mm -hmm. right? not public investment, maybe a little bit, but really private investment that sort of says, oh, well, you know, that's a nice address. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to invest there. So there's another iteration of these drawings which suggests that the lower density development that's happening around it, parking lots, et cetera, might actually end up being more intensified uh, in terms of private development than the kinds of things that you guys are showing on the periphery of your interventions. Yeah, Dean. You know, Dean, some of that's addressed in their early analysis uh, slides where they would refer to something as a underutilized or they would highlight what the potential was and the reverse of that would be what's underutilized. And I was looking at that slide thinking, the same thing that you can take that information and say, yeah, while you're moving on with this intervention, you could also say, here's an, here's an opportunity as well. That's not just about the intervention, it's about sort of the economics of saying, okay, here's, here's one business that's thriving and here's one that's not. And so as an, it's an investment map in a certain sense. Yeah. So I think the bones are there for that is exactly what you're saying. I, uh, 
just to uh, add a few things, su such strong work, I want to compliment your, um, your team, uh, team effort, your kind of collaboration, so well done. Strong analysis, actually, I think is remarkable. You know, you're picking up on that there's been this in public, public realm investment in absolutely the wrong places relative to the kind of centers of gravity in terms of public life. So great approach of using public life as a driver for targeting interventions. Um, you know, the, the Plan Parcial took a stab at some of this stuff, but you guys have carried it so much further. Um, I, there's something about the quality of your intervention drawings, which I, it's just, um, they're really charming and lively, almost like a Roy Lichtenstein kind of pop art in some way. There's just a lot of movement in them. And somehow through even your sort of, uh, you know, the, the color choices, you're capturing something about the spirit of the neighborhood. You know, if you walk around those Western neighborhoods, you see a lot of buildings painted in these kind of tones and colors. You know, I would, typically I would agree with Root and others about the kid of hearts approach. But what I think is interesting about your drawings is that it implies that, you know, there's always this tension in tactics and acupuncture between the strategic frame and the content produced by the kind of local actors. You know, what's the relationship between the strategy and the tactics? And I think what's interesting about your, your kind of design proposals is that they imply that there's a basic level of sort of continuous infrastructure provision, but then actually your, your local community partner, your local bakery, your local uh, you know, youth center, they fill in the content and they're invited to actually populate you know, what and how these places work and what they are in a very perhaps eclectic way that reflects the, the kind of diversity of the neighborhood. So you've captured the spirit of that really quite well. So um, a lot of great information here. And I think actually a really great roadmap uh, for the DPA in terms of where and how you might target uh, these kind of short-term uh, investments. I'm gonna add yet some more compliments over here. Uh, congratulations, you guys! Really, really, greatly ac accomplished. Um, especially because I think that um, uh, you show uh, the uh, benefit of having followed that um, route that we 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 recommended. Right, going from analysis to crafting a vision using the vision to informing a series of strategies and then applying those strategies for a series of design interventions. That is very visible in your work. And it is what is really giving um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, coherence and, and, um, and nuance to, to the quality of your work. The analysis is certainly very strong. And so strong analysis makes for strong strategies and then strong strategies have made for, for good design interventions. Uh, also, a lot of work. I remember that all of us were saying, "Are you really sure you want to develop all of <laughs> that solution? Maybe, maybe you just do two or three. And you were, no, no, no. We're gonna go ahead. We're gonna make it. And you, you were able to get to a pretty resolved, uh, pretty resolved uh, design solution for each case. And it's not easy, especially because each site, uh, you know, has. Uh, some uh, issues related to vehicular traffic to be solved. And you have solved them in a very credible way to the degree that, you know, you could really go ahead and try some of those solutions with, with, with asphalt painting and, and temporary bollards. And of course, that's the beauty of pilots and, and, uh, and, uh, and the tactical approach that you, could, that you could then, you know, adjust them over time if one or two of what uh, you propose, one of two of the design solution, what you propose doesn't quite work, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, from what we see on the screen, everything seems to make a lot of sense and would be, you know, cooked enough to be deployed. Um, also, one, uh, one comment on the aesthetics. Um, it, it seems like everybody is, um, you know, happy about that too, and I am too. Uh, I think I, 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 I was telling you guys, like, this reminds me of some kind of pop artist, but I don't remember who. And then, of course, John um, found the exact reference that, that, that we had in, maybe hid in our mind. But, um, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, this, yeah, the aesthetics is great. And my encouragement is own it even more. So you got those accents that looks like 
something between a you know a, a pop art painting and a video game. Um, there's something charming about it. Make it your language even more, right? Be even more extreme about it if you want to. I also really like the the collages that um, have something um, also very poetic about. I appreciated that you were able to find an entourage that was very real. Like I could, you know, I believe those people that you put in the in the collages there are people from there. It's obvious. And it is not a detail, like you're really showing that you're connecting with the place. You're, you're really creating um, uh, drawings and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, images that you could share with the community. The community would feel represented and would want to engage with some of the design solutions that you have uh, proposed for, for them and with them. So uh, very, very accomplished. Thank you so Thank you. much means a lot. <laughs> Two thumbs up. Okay, I'm not, if y'all have any more comments, I can just take it off and we can go to break. I just, I don't want to take it off <laughs> to talk about stuff. <laughs> Um, I, this is just a minor thing, just in terms of this present, this page has been on the screen forever and I love it. And I feel like there was so much work that you guys presented in each, each six of these strategies. I, I, actually, this page is pretty awesome. And I wonder if you were to redo it again, this page would come like as a teaser at the very beginning, mm -hmm. you know, closer to that. So you can you can get a sense, everyone get a sense like, oh, these six things are coming. Wow, I'm so excited. I can't wait to like see more about these, you know, versus at the very end. Like you show them, show them twice. Just yeah. in my mind, kind of when I'm presenting professionally, it's like you kind of want to give these little teasers, but also like because there was so much work and I didn't know when it was going to end, but I, but in a good way, but I was just like, some a page like, a page like this is like very nice to have up front for an audience to know, Hey, this is what we're, this is what we're going to see in this presentation. Just cause it's been up here in my, in my mind, um, just for a kind of, you know, mull over that for your professional career. But, um, definitely that, that's just an interesting thing about. So you I, would, you would say I was going to go to the bathroom, but this is coming up. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> did very intentionally make sure I put the diagram of our public space first. Last time we presented it, we kept getting questions about it. We're like, it's coming, it's coming. So I made sure to show y'all the public space diagram first. Yeah. So y'all knew there was a logic to our badness. <laughs> it's better. Well, I, I was just gonna say that, um, yeah, I, I'm very impressed with what you guys were able to do this semester. I think you've got an entire chapter of the book we're gonna put together already pretty much cooked. Um, so even the way you've sort of organized it, um, all of that is um, really very well done. And I'm looking forward to putting all of this work together um, as a publication, you know, together with Gail. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. All right, guys. Sorry, was that Nicole? Oh, that was Giga. Uh, it was me again. Um, very briefly, um, it seems like maybe we have still a couple of minutes before we, um, before our break. I, I just want to make a comment uh, about um, about how these things are coming together. Um, you know, how we're starting to see the arc of each individual work side by side with um, one one with the other. You know, um, interestingly enough, my comment. Uh, on the on the on the work of Nicole and and John Mark was like, this is great. The next step would be try to understand how we're gonna make this happen, you know, in connection with the needs of the community. Uh, your work, um, if you will, because we're starting at a different scale and we're starting with this or uh, trying to solve different problems, has provided that step forward, right? Um, of course, John Mark and Nicole had to focus on green infrastructure, and so I had a you know, had to tackle the complexity related to, to, to those issues. But, but here, you know, you, here you are, you didn't have to work on that and you had much more bandwidth leeway to really understand what, um, uh, you know, the street level was asking for and your work is about that. So now I like to think that, you know, those two 
works together make a pretty comprehensive strategy to address both issues of green infrastructure and issues of public space improvement and to weave, uh, you know, um, to weave things together. Um, so it's, it's nice to see how the group of each work is really um, something that is enriching and completing um, uh, the work of other groups. Also, too, um, I know we have our friends from Monterey on the line, uh, and I just want to say, feel free to chime in on any one of these presentations uh, to give any you know comments or questions. I know you're probably just taking it all in for the first time, seeing everything, but uh, would love to engage in dialogue and conversation, and just hear thoughts too about um, all the work you've seen today. And um, if, if you know the floor is yours whenever you want it, just feel free um, to dive in. Okay, guys, um, I think we're going to break and uh, we'll come back at three o'clock. Um, and like uh, earlier today, I'm going to leave the Zoom session running and I'm just going to put it on a kind of filler screen. And, um, so we'll be back in about half an hour. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Charlton. Thank you, and great to meet you. While we're waiting for everyone to get back online, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, since I don't think you're on this morning, right? No, unfortunately, I was on my kid turn, no my kid duty, and I couldn't. No problem. So, a really quick background um, before we get started. We actually have the good fortune, I guess of uh, we have one more pair left. Um, so we've had five pairs. We have 10 students in the studio overall. Mm -hmm. So we've got one more left um, and that's what we'll see this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, real quick, so the urban design program, the way I sort of described it to uh, Gigo Di Tommaso and John Bella and Ruth is now from, from uh, Gal Studios as well is that the first semester when students come into the school, um, it's a mixture of students. So it's, we, ha we actually have one student uh, in the studio that is a MLA student. Um, the students that come into the urban design program, some have architecture backgrounds, some have landscape backgrounds, some have planning backgrounds. And uh, occasionally there's a dual degree student who may not have any design background, but is simultaneously doing the planning program with urban design. So it's a mixture of um, experiences. And so what I tried to do is I try to use the fall semester to give them more exposure to let's say formal syntax of you know morphology like urban block structures, systems of order, uh, ways of looking at the city systemically as well as spatially know, introduction to things like figure grounds and analysis and all that sort of stuff. And so we do a kind of joint studio together with uh, the second year MLA students. So last fall worked with Maggie Hansen and we did a project in Seattle. Um, and the idea was to do for the next five years projects in like Seattle, Vancouver, Portland, sort of big, you know, not big, but sort of medium scale American cities in the Pacific Northwest that are good examples of North American urbanism. And then in the spring to kind of go the other scale and start to get down to the human kind of experiential scale, right? Um, as opposed to the sort of top down sort of formal, formal uh, syntax kind of scale. Mm -hmm. And so this semester and hopefully kind of into the future, uh, the urban design program contracted with Gell Studios, uh, the, their San Francisco office, to kind of lead the subject of the studio, which is um, in Monterrey. Um, and they have been doing work with uh, UERE, which is the one of the universities down in Monterrey that's mm -hmm. located in a, one of the central kind of, let's call it historical districts um, the Distrito Purisima Alameda, uh, DPA, 
Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was that the studio would do a series of desktop research, looking at you know everything from climate to transportation at a regional scale, economy, culture, all sorts of things. Um, and then we went and visited Monterey for about four days, uh, and it was very, very um, intensive. And Uere was very good at hooking us up with different constituencies in the city uh, to show us all the sort of things that were going on, uh, particular in our district, but also in some adjoining ones. Um, and I believe some of them will be uh, at least um, listening in on the conversations today. And then, um, then they broke, uh, and then they d developed sort of vision statements for how they could see the future of the district. And then um, they sort of reorganized into five groups, uh, looking at five different strategies uh, that focused on sort of mobility, morphology, green infrastructure, uh, urban acupuncture, and then the one that we're going to see this afternoon, uh, which is um, kind of adaptive reuse. Adaptive reuse, yeah. I stuff. looked at that project. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the intent is to sort of take all that stuff and kind of fine tune it a little bit and make a little sort of documentation out of it. But basically, you know, uh, all the projects are meant to superimpose on top of each other. It's not sort of you know, 10 projects that are alternatives to each other. They all, they all kind of are meant to work together. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're up to. And uh, John Bella and Gigo Di Tommaso are two of the partners at Gell, and they're both here. Um, and together with Justin Garrison, who um, is an urban designer working uh, locally with Lake Flato. Um, and uh, so the idea was that, you know, Gail would come in four times during the semester. It didn't really quite work out that way because of the situation we're in. Um, and I have to say they've really stepped up and, uh, you know, been involved in extensive Zoom conversations with the students, like beyond the call of the contract, so to speak. <laughs> um, uh, and I... And I'm sure the students appreciate that, and I certainly do. Um, uh, James, is it James or Jim or what? Uh, I go by Jim. Jim, okay. Um, I don't know you, I don't think. No, I don't think we've had the pleasure of meeting. I'm, I'm a principal at GFF Architects here in the Austin office. I'm the managing director. Um, this is my first time doing a crit with you guys. So okay. we've been involved in the, uh, in the career fairs for a number of years. Um, I have quite a few students, uh, both in my Dallas office and in my Austin office that are UT grads and I'm glad to be here. Um, did you catch any of that description I just gave to Benjamin about what the studio was doing? I did not, I joined a little bit late. I got the password a little late. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, my apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> you were not on my original schedule, which is probably why I didn't have it sent to you. Um, so in fact, rather than repeat it, what I'm gonna do is ask the student team that is going to be presenting and we have one more group of two students left. So we have a kind of lighter session this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna let them perhaps uh, introduce not only their project, but maybe a little bit of the context for their project, uh, working with Gale Studios, et cetera, if that's, if that's okay. Um, is Gigo back on? I am. I'm here. Okay, there he is. Um, are you okay with with uh, Mendy and and May sort of letting letting uh, James know kind of what the studio is about as a preamble Ab to their presentation? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, then I think we're ready to begin. Mangdi and May, take it away. Mm. Hello, everyone. Mm. Our team is, is, uh, is Adaptive Reuse, and I'm Mizi Young. And I'm Mindy Young. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
Our main goal is to activate the city and address the city by revitalizing the buildings. And the first thing we do is do some research in the DPA. And the, and the first issue in DPA we think is functional separate. As you can see in the first one, um, the residential area are mainly on the northwest and uh, the residents are mainly elderly and the house is old and out of repair and there are a lot of vacant houses and it's uh, dominated by single family uh, density, lack of social housing and it's also lack of in economic activities, no attractions, no public transportation and you can see at, uh, on the second line it shows the commercial area is mainly on the south, it's mainly on the south, south uh, southeast, and it's also low density, lack of open space, and lack of social housing, nowhere for people to live, and the use of buildings are, sim are simple, only has two mixed use buildings. And uh, on the last uh, on the last line, we can see the relationship between the residential and the commercial. You can see the working place and the living place are separated to each other. The function of buildings are too simple, like of multifunction buildings, low density, and a lack of open space, and it's losing of, uh, of population. Okay. And the second issue we found in DPA is uh, a lot of vacant buildings, as shown in as shown in the picture, are right spot. And, and because of there are a lot of vacant buildings, so we think there are greater potential to active the city by revitalizing these vacant buildings. And on the right side on this page, they show some examples of vacant buildings. And uh, here are our strategies. Uh, first, we want to uh, deploy from separate unit and cluster to mix functions and the characters. As, um, as I mentioned, the function are separated to each other in DBA. Uh, and we don't think it's a good idea. So we want to uh, make a block uh, mix of functions and characters. So it's uh, good for the economic, economic and it's, it's, it's also good for human because people can live, work, and play in the same area. They don't have to travel along, travel in long densities. And the Second one, we can see we want to uh, deploy from low density and a single use block to, uh, to middle rise and mixed use block. We want to add some density here and make some add on on the buildings. Um, so they are good for economic as well. And the people can also can live, work, play in the same areas. It's really good for the city to develop. And the, the last thing we want is from is uh, we want to deploy from a disconnected area to an integrated area because this area uh, is really in, in an interesting place. It's near to the industrial area. It's, uh, it's next to the uh, Monterey Center. So we want to integrate these areas together, make connection to, to this context. And uh, here are the strategies to in our in our set. And the first thing we want to do is uh, revitalize, revitalize some buildings. And this building are the point in this in our set. We want to revitalize these buildings. And here are some revitalized buildings on the right side as an example. Yes. And uh, after revitalize these uh, buildings, we want to make a function connection to each other and make some active lines. And as you can see, the right, the right lines are commercial um, activity, uh, active line and the, and the yellow orange line are many attractive, attractive lines. And we, want to, and we also want to make a connection to the river and make, and make, the, landscape, and make the landscape landscape along the river into the our set and because we have this point and lines around to make this 
point to be areas and make a and make a huge influence to our site. For example, like a commercial area, uh, they uh, we want to put more program in this area, like like a station, like a hotel, like some office, like some amenities, so they can have a huge influence in our site and make huge impact to our site and make this city more attractive to people. And here are our here are our building real strategies. The first line shows what we want to do to change the low rise density. First, we want to soft edge. In terms of soft edge, we want to add some balcony on the on the top floors, so the so the building can have a relationship to the street. We also want to add some small greening in front of the buildings so people can have really nice spot to relax, to see, to gather. And we also want to take use of some vacant buildings and program these vacant buildings, like put some office here, put some uh, commercial here, so people can live work, live work play together. And what we want to do about a low rise commercial, we want to we use the second floor because in Monterey, a lot of commercial commercial buildings don't use the second floor. They just use the first floor as commercial. So we want to use the, the second floor to put some studio functions, company function on the top on the on the second floor. And also we want to make some terrace and sidewalk. And the terrace can make connection. Can, can let people sit on the terrace and uh, watch the street and uh, feel the street, make connection to the building and the street, and uh, set up the concrete space for people to gather and to have coffee, to have a cup of coffee, and to walk, and to vendor shopping. And and the and the, the second line shows what we want to do in other kind of low rise commercial. And we want to make some end on on these buildings. And put some functions on these buildings, like uh, companies, something like that, to make to make a uh, density here. And they also want to transfer in the ground floor, like we use columns, like we use grass, something like that, so it can make connection from inside and outside. And about middle rise residential. Uh, currently, uh, there are a lot of vacant buildings or other buildings within the block. So, want to demolish demolish some buildings and uh, make a and uh, make some garden in in the block, and also integrate the uh, buildings to other to other buildings, and make mixed function in this block. Make make this block more appealing to people. And about high rise residentials, now this. The first floor in these high residentials are for cars. They are mainly for the car, for the, for the parking. And so we want to free the floor and we want to change the first floor as some um, commercial or some service centers, com uh, community service center, something like that. So they can, to, they can use it by man, used by human and attract to people. And I also want to add some roof garden on the top of the buildings. So it's good for the environment and also create a place for people to gather. And about high rise commercial, I want to mix function vertically. Uh, like like uh, uh, we put some residential on the top of the floor and make some company in the middle and uh, make some commercial in the beneath to change the single use of the building because this because it's really good for the for the city growth, and also want both and also we want to transfer in the ground floor and make connection from the inside to the outside. And uh, that's all. Okay, as Miss said, we focus on the adaptive reuse as a cartoonist to show people how can we make the DPA area better. So me and May will pick up each pick up one location to do the different uh, review stretch. So my project is called the alley. So 
as you say, my location is at the east, uh, southeast of the part of the EPA area. Actually, the location of this is quite interesting because in this drawing, you can see there are two being, uh, they, are, or they are both the very important public open space in DPA. So the Plaza Almeida and the Plaza Resima. And my location is just uh, between the main commute way. And it's just like a barrier to disconnect this, this commute way. So my main proposed proposal in my design is to reconnect this uh, pedestrian road. So there are on the right side, there are three pictures to give you a better understanding to see what, where my location is in the city context. Okay. So the first slide is the other says about the land use. So this is my site. So as you can see, there are plenty of the little commercial, the red one and the yellow one, the residential uh, around my site. And in my site, there are three interesting points. The, the first one is there is a big, large parking space in my site. And also the second one is also there are some, the block one is uh, some unoccupied buildings. So, and also there are some many vacant space. This means I have plenty of the flexibility for me to redesign or reuse this space for people to create a new open space. And the third one is there are two, the purple, the dark purple one, are two educational institution. So this can be a driver to uh, attract people, especially the young people, the students, to get in our, my site. So next slide is honestly about the social space. So the dark Block is a building that provides space, and the gray is a public space. So you can say this is a public space, and this is a very important public space, the Plaza Resima. And the yellow color means also the public space, but it will close after working hours. This means there are church, there are some university, there are some educational facilities, something like this. And uh, this two big circle means the social life happens there. So this means there are two important uh, locations just around my site. So this, this is very important to create a new connection in my site. So before I get into the real design maps, I will show you, I'll just give you a refer to show what uh, this six important points of my design will look like. So I will talk about the first about the left side features. The, the first one is to show how the entrance of this connection, there is a connection, the connection will be. And the second one, this is very interesting. This is a food truck alley. I will add a food truck just beside this main connection as a driver to keep people there, to buy food, to eat food there. And the third one is to show how this main connection will be. It will be a cover, actually. The reason why I use a cover, because the weather, especially in summer in Monterey is super hot. So I think uh, we need a cover walkway to provide people the shade. So then the people are more willing to stay here and close there. And the fourth picture is to show a reused building. Actually, there is a, like the night factory building there. So I proposed to reuse it to become a big market building. And the fourth, the fifth, and the, the sixth picture are all to show I create a new mid block uh, courtyard there. So this is what it looks like in the future. So this is the existing function of my side. So as I said, there, there are like the dark purple, there are four parking space. So there are plenty of the parking space and the vacant north for me to build a new open space. And uh, the most interesting one is the dark purple, there are two institute in my side. And uh, the red one is a commercial. So I have to keep all the little commercial and uh, to create is a new open space around the commercial to revitalize this commercial. So, 
come to the proposed function map. So as I said, I changed all the parking space and all the vacant lot to the open, open space, like the food truck alley and the covered roadway. So this is just like the main connection through this block. And I keep all the red one, the commercial building. And the blue one is a building that I reused to a, park, to a market building. And also on the right side of the block, I add two green space. One is a trace with coffee table and chairs that people can sit here and enjoy the time there. So I will show you a detail later in the axonometric map. And there is a little garden there. So, so um, to this, this is a design concept diagram that I also I totally have six. This is the first one to show this is my site and uh, there is a very important connection from Plaza Alameda to Plaza Brisima, but there are three unoccupied buildings. They are just like a barrier to disconnect the connection from there to there. So into the sixth step, I demolish these three buildings to open this whole space to mean to make a new connection. And uh, there are also the gray area of four parking space and uh, vacant land, vacant space. So in the future, I will use it to be a new open space. This is the third one. We have a new connection, main connection from this plaza to this smart plaza. And I also add some density into this site. I change some shape, I have some new uh, building to make this block more dense. And I also have a bit more uh, attuned new movement. People can use this main function to get in this mid block courtyard that I made. The fourth one is how this main connection will look like. So the main connection actually is a covered walkway, as I said. And uh, besides this covered walkway, there is a new food truck and that. So people can choose to just walking through this walkway or they can just stand by into this food truck alley to buy some food and to eat some food there. But also they can get in this uh, middle block courtyard and to drink coffee there or get into this garden during time. And uh, there are also some little red arrow there. This means they are all access to into this block. And the fifth one is uh, I show the purple, two purple buildings, uh, as I said, uh, or educational institution. So it can be as a driver to track people, especially the young people in this site. The last one is to show the function of the every building. So the dark red is an existing commercial, so I keep them poor. And the light red is a new mixed-use building. And the most important one is this one, the blue one, is that I reuse the, the factory building into a new uh, market building. So this is a design concept. So I came to, this is a axonometric map that to give you a better understanding to, to say what the map in this site will be. So I have the five circle to show the zooming condition of, of my very five important point in this design. So the first one is to show the covered uh, walkway will be how it will look like. So it, you can see the cover is on, the, on your head and you can just cross the way. And the second one is to show how it will look like of, about the inside of this market building. So they have multiple function, have different like the food, like the uh, food and everything so here. So people can buy things there and also people can through the interest from this part of this part. So this not just a mark building and also like the passage for people to transit. And third one is to show the, the mid block courtyard where it looks like is there are some trays. So you can see people under the trays, there are some chair and table, you can do coffee there. But this is a relative provide space uh, there. 
So the, this one is to show the food truck alley just besides the main connection. And uh, there are also some people can go into this food truck alley and buy some food. And this one is to show how this garden is in this place. So people can join the time there. Okay, so this is on a some metric map. Next, next one is to show the market building. What, what I designed for the market building very next slide. So the location of the market building is there. And uh, at the first floor, I designed a many connection, many entrance. So people can transit easily in this market building through this entrance. And the second layer is um, I built some many literalized structure just divide this market building into different parts. So after this, we have uh, many like the movement inside this market building. So this building not just like not just a market, but also a half opened passage for people to transit. And for say each part and the fourth layer is each part I have a different function. And uh, five years I have a new roof for this. So this is uh, like the programming for this new market building, the reduced strategy. And uh, this one is uh, overall planning for this whole site. So as you can see, as I said, this is the main connection just between us in this block. And there are some food truck just be beside this main connection. And uh, there is little garden. Number four is little garden. Number three is some where the made block courtyard. There are some table and chairs under the trees. So people can join the time there. And around this middle block courtyard, they are all commercial and let's use around. Them. So, uh, finish this plan. Next is some one perspective to show how the covered walkway and the food truck body will look like. So, this is the covered. Walkway and there are some food truck just beside this walkway. So people can through through by this walkway or they can just get into this area to buy some food to stay here to buy some food on the food truck on it. And uh, this is another perspective to show how the knife will be in the middle block where so people can stay here, can walk down the tray so they can they have some little commercial just around this space. So that's it. That's it for my design. If to make okay, thank you Nandi. And um, my choose location to adapt reuse is commercial area and the ultimate goal of the of the redevelopment of the city's con, con, uh, commercial center is to continue the city space uh, uh, continue the city's. Can you first one? Okay. Uh, uh, consumers can, uh, the city, uh, and so, as you can see, here, here is the existing condition in our set. And uh, as you can see in the photo, the right spot is our set, and it's, uh, and it's, uh, and it's uh, near to two commercial access, but, uh, this one and uh, this one. And the area mainly, and the and this area is the commercial center for the DPA. And the, this area are mainly used for commercial. And there are a lot of huge commercial buildings, commercial street, commercial sh uh, street shops, supermarket, convenience store, and so on. So commercial here are really well developed. And the transportation is really convenient. There are bus station and uh, and the subway station in our set. And um, and our purpose to our set is to uh, reinforce the commercial and the cultural identity in this area. Like we want to expand expand the commercial use, expand the cultural use, expand the amenity use. We add a right in the mount in the monitoring. And then we also want and some uh, new social housing, community center service, and uh, open space 
contribute to regeneration of the neighborhood. And also, we want to take advantage of the public transportation to strengthen the relationship to the other area. And which are, uh, sorry. And which are, this is the best one. And here are, and here are, and here are station in our set. Thank you. And here are the existing land use in our set. And the rice box are commercial, are, are used for commercial. So you can see there are a lot of commercial in our set. And uh, the and the blue one are the parking lot. So we can see several parking lot in our set. And it's only, and it's basically all for the commercial, basically no residential here, no other use. So to change the simple use in our set, we want to put more programming in my set. Like we put some uh, fitness center, museum, or companies in our set to make this to make this area more attractive to people. It's not just a commercial area, but it's for a living area. That's it. And the next slide, I want to talk about how to regeneration and what's the process to regenerate. And the first thing we do is demolish some buildings. And we want to demolish buildings which are in low conditions, vacant, and don't have historical and cultural values. Uh, here are shows on the right side are, are green ones. And the second, and the second one, Want to and the second one to adaptive use some buildings. We want to adaptive some low condition but in used buildings, some vacant but in good condition buildings, and adapt some single use buildings. Here shows on the right side are the are the blue ones, and also want to and some new buildings to create a density. Uh, first, we want to make some new social housing on our side and also create a density near the station, which are in the corner uh, to attract people. And they will also want to create a density along the avenue to make the, the connection, to make a connection corridor and connect to the residential area. And also we want to add some public space which related to the buildings, which shows on the orange on the right side. And uh, in the end, we want to make an integrated mixed use, high density, commercial, and transient center. And uh, here are the axons. And uh, the most important building I want to talk about is, is this is, is, is the station, is, 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 is station center, because station is, is the main things, main things people are arbitrative. People can get on the get on the station, get off station. So here there are a huge population here. So this is really important building. So we want to really mix use building here. So we create a station center, create a, a multifunction buildings and uh, meet people and uh, meet people's need for the shopping, for the coffee, for the restaurant, for the amenity, for the work, for the living, um, for the livings and. Uh, and uh, related to this building, and we want to make a commercial plaza to attract people. And also it can gather some seasonal events, it can gather some food truck here to make, the, to make this block really, really attractive, really, really, really appealing. It's not just a station or a commercial, but it's a, a main point in this set. And uh, also want to Put some unknowns, which show the light, uh, which shows our dark blue on the 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 axons. And we want to add some uh, companies, residential, um, something like that to provide space for the business. And it's also concrete density here, it's not just a, you know a simple low density, it's it can higher the density here. And also want to renew 
renew a, a hospital and uh, we want to take use the uh, old hospital buildings and revitalize as a community center and health, the healthcare centers for the local residents and make the inner place in this block open to the public, open to the street, and make this front attractive to the peoples and make this place can gather for the peoples. And also along the commercial street on the uh, as shown on the right, we want to uh, and uh, want to end some small company on the second floor and uh, and some studio and, and some restaurant as well so it can provide space for the businessmen it's not just a simple commercial street but it's mixed use commercial street and and also want to add some uh, community uh, community but also want to add a new social housing project and it created and we take use of the vacant buildings and take, and uh, some blocks so people can really live here and uh, also it can create a space for the residents for for live or play because there are community park here next to these buildings and I also want to renew a parking parking lot we want to enter some uh, related to commercial use in, in the parking like we can and put some car movie theater here, put some store restaurants, bakery on the second floors, and we can add some roof gardens on the top so people can play on the on the on the roof. Yes, thank you. And here are the sections. So you can have clear vision how to how it's used vertically to the buildings. It's not just the simple use of buildings anymore. So the, the purple shows the hotel, the right shows the commercial, and the blue shows the company, and orange shows the station, green shows the park, and, and the yellow shows the residential. So you can see they are highly mixed use, and it's also have some um, really nice space along the street to have a really good relationship to the buildings. And also we add some roof garden on some buildings so it, it so it can attract to the peoples and also create and also can make up the space uh, building building are taken. Nice. And and the next few slides I want to talk about how to use to the space. And here are examples of, of a commercial building near the station and a bus stop. And the use in these buildings are highly misused. It is for commercial, it's for transparent, tra uh, transport is for companies, for home office. So you can see, um, I, uh, I use glass to transparent the first to, to the ground floor. So people can see inside and uh, on the street and the people from inside can, can, can take a look on the street. So they have really strong, relationship from the for the buildings to the street it's really good for the city's safety because people can have an eye on the street and also i want to treat the corner of the buildings they can have it can have really they can have a relationship with the intersections and it's also can inviting people to go inside these buildings also i create a sidewalk on near uh, along the buildings because because of this uh, uh, comfortable sidewalk, people can take a cup of coffee, can window shopping, uh, or dress waiting for bus come. So it's really, so it's really good for people to walk, to to rest, to buy things. It's really good for the humans. Yes. And uh, here. Here are the example of the commercial street. Uh, it's for the commercial use, and it's also have some small company on the top floor, or some studio, or some residential. So what we want to do is uh, change the street from the car to the pedestrian road, and add some chairs and trees in the street, so people can sit in the great in the great trees shadow and relax on this. 
on this really good chairs. So this street is no longer just for the cars, but it's uh, for the design for the humans. And uh, also I uh, added some terrains on the top floors. So people can sit on the terrains and uh, take, a look, take a look on the, on the street. So it can create a connection to the buildings and the street. It's uh, good for the uh, safety of the city. And it's uh, also can good for the city's development. Okay. And here is some of the community center. And what we want to do is uh, open the small space inside the block and inviting people to go inside the block and create a really nice gathering place where people can play, can read, can take a rest. And also I want to use company to transparent, to transparent the buildings and make a strong connection from the inside to the outside. And people can sit in the, uh, between, the, between the community. Next. Come. And here are the residential area. In the past, here are few, uh, here are falling off of the uh, vacant building or the buildings. So what we did is, uh, is demolish these buildings and create a, uh, a nice courtyard, so people can play here, can take a rest here, and it's really environmental friendly for the city. And also, well, and also we free the ground floor, and it's we put uh, put we in the this ground this ground floor are open to the public. People can can eat here, can read some books here, can play some sports here. It's for the public service. For the, com for the community service use is no longer a block area. So the buildings are have relationship to, the, to this courtyard. And that's all, thank you. Thank you guys. Make uh, and Mengdi, can you go back to that? Um, slide where you show the overall strategy for the transformation of the different um, elements of the fabric. Pretty early on, you have one that shows, you know, this kind of successive succession of operations. So a little further, please. This is, this is your analysis. So in the analysis, you explain that you want to kind of further diversify uses and you want to have more uh, kind of a more diverse mix of, of uses all across the neighborhood. Uh, then I, you have those nice diagrams, one, one back. Okay. You, okay, you got these nice diagrams that show the overall strategy is about um, integrate new functions, have a kind of this uh, diverse character, and then there's some kind of densification and, con and further connection. Okay, but then I was actually looking for some other diagrams that you show a little further, because I think those are kind of the, here we go. So you got, you got these strategies for, for different kind of fabric, right? So you got one for the low rise residential fabric, one for the low rise commercial. And then you got another strategy for the low rise commercial to densify. Then you got something for the mid rise and something for the high rise. Okay. I wanna, I wanna maybe start here because this is a good place to start. Uh, you know, uh, your, your project is very ambitious I, I, and interesting in many, many ways. I think one of the most interesting bits, which I think you know, is, is a good place to start is, is this overall strategy. It's almost like you're kind of envisioning this um, ecological succession, but for the buildings, right? So you go from lower height to higher uh, rise. You go from monofunctional to polyfunctional, multifunctional uh, buildings. Um, and you, you, you devise this strategy that then you are able to kind of use all across the project. I think that's one of the most interesting 
aspect of it and it's it's well represented so i just want to foreground this as we start the conversation yeah i, I want to jump in on that a little bit too i find that that sort of let's call it tactical analysis um is in a way the real strength of this project um, and i wrote down a series of questions just to be provocative as i was listening to the presentation one is um how possible is it to legislate program? You know, uh, we've been talking about uh, form-based codes within the DPA and all that sort of stuff. Is it enough to just say, I want this program to be on the second floor and I want this other program to be on the third floor? You know, can we actually, I, I think the agenda or the values of going from a kind of monoprogrammatic set of zones to something more, mixed, diverse, hybridized, you know, absolutely appreciate. The question is, how do you get there beyond just saying that's going to be this? Um, and I, and so that, that for me is where the real sort of um, rubber meets the road <laughs> uh, in terms of what are the architectural strategies that one has to kind of employ in order to transition the district from or pieces of the district from a monoprogrammatic condition to a to a diverse and hybrid programmatic condition um, and I wonder to what and what I like about these sets of diagrams is that they suggest um, let's call it infrastructural improvements to the buildings so that the buildings are adapted to allow for programs to colonize them in different ways um, without being specific necessarily about what programs, right? But that they allow a kind of mixture of programs. I mean, that kind of interesting thing is happening, for instance, in Dallas. Uh, Dallas in the 80s was developed downtown with a lot of big high rise office buildings. It's the sort of quintessential American city that's dead after five o'clock. And they're going back in, they're adapting those high rises as residential now um, in order to get people to start living in the downtown part of the city. So my question is sort of, you know, around this piece, which is what are the things that you can do in order to make these um, existing architectural infrastructures uh, accommodate uh, or not even just accommodate, but maybe uh, encourage uh, a diversity of, of um, new uses. Uh, because uh, because there are a lot of buildings are not in used, so I think it's really good for revitalize. And also, like the like this picture shows, um, the beneath there are high rise commercial buildings, and actually, uh, the top of floor are actually not into the use; they are vacant. So I think. Program here is really easy. Yeah. I'll add something to um I agree with what was said about these strategies being being, you know, there's a lot there and there's some interesting points you're bringing up. And I also really I enjoyed the, the way you were starting to talk about the connection between um, La Alameda and La Purissima and sort of found this street that wasn't connecting. Um, and then you're trying to kind of pull people and integrate those two spaces through a series of um, kind of tactical moves and uh, different program ideas. Um, I think one, one thing I would suggest is that you extend that gesture to also include the 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 surrounding streets. So I think you, you're focusing a lot on this one block, uh, which is kind of, you know, it's this big reveal. It's like, oh, we an analyze the maps and we, you know, there's all there's this like tight grid um, and really interesting kind of fine grade city blocks. And you've kind of identified this piece that isn't connecting. And that's like a really exciting thing to as a departure point. But then don't forget to sort of extend that into the, um, is it Juan Villagran, the streets? That, can, that doesn't quite connect and then it turns as into Padre Mier like that is a very important connection as you as you go from your block to the connection to La Purissima and then I saw I I, I was going to say something about overall kind of your illustrations I think there's some powerful you're very good at diagramming very complex things into a simple into a simple way 
Um, I think your black and white photos are very kind of elegant, but maybe they, they weren't quite doing the kind of more tactile things that especially an adaptive reuse brief might call for. So I would suggest pairing your diagrams with some more kind of built project images that you're like, oh, it could be a bit like this. And maybe those photos could be colored and you really kind of really get a feel for what kind of spaces you're trying to recreate. This, this, this works quite well. I think the one they have on the screen now where you're kind of showing as different examples and saying it could be a bit like this. So I think using more of this tactic could be, could be really good to pair your little diagrams with some photos. Um, and I had one more thing jotted down. Oh, I, I was gonna say that the, the black and white photos don't quite do it, but then there's this moment when you show us the, the, the covered walkway. When I first heard covered, I was like, oh, covered? Does it need to be covered? But then I understand that it's more of a kind of shade protection. And there's this one image that shows just before that red. I think that's really lovely. And you start to hint at materiality and uh, shade and actually quite a low tech approach to some of these things which I think is very nice. So I, I, I would kind of welcome having more of those kinds of images that um, bridge the sort of very diagram and the kind of polished 3D view. I think that's nice. And then at the end, I, I missed a kind of summary of, of, of or a kind of overview. Um, and maybe again, going back to um, a point that was made at the previous presentation, maybe that's something that you repeat right at the beginning to set the scene and at the end to kind of summarize, but I think there's some, there's some strong ideas here. Well, if I, if I might just uh, jump in, uh, I, I just want to commend you for, for, for this, for the amount of work and for the quality of the work that you are presenting here. I think it looks at all the, from a city from different points of view at, at different scales. I really appreciate the, you know, the, the overall strategy uh, for both projects, uh, uh, definitely very ambitious projects. You know, it's always run, was running in, in the back of my mind. Okay, this is a very desirable situation for many, many cities and many, many other places, right? So who, who is it going to invest here? And, and, and what is it about this space that actually triggers that investment, right? I think that you guys were looking at some uh, specific conditions. For instance, this one that we have on the on the on the on the screen, uh, the the connection between Plaza Alameda, Plaza La Purísima, understanding that there is a lot of potential to continue that street uh, uh, in order or to open up that street in order to make even a stronger connection between the two places, finding it as a nodal point that can articulate these two, uh, what I believe are public spaces, right? And um, and I think that is that's that's uh, that's remarkable, right? That really makes a a lot of sense from the from the point of view of uh, strategizing how uh, different actions can play a role uh, and can make an impact within the city. But again, you know, I, I appreciate the ambition and, and find it find it you know well. It's always good <laughs> to think about to think about different uh, uh, possibilities that the city might have that probably they haven't even uh, explored. Um, so, and also appreciate if you go forward, perhaps one slide, and it's just somebody is going to use it as an example. You know, the level of uh, resolution. So we are going, we are seeing, you know, from uh, something that is very strategic. Just go back in terms of looking at, um, you know, the whole city uh, or the elements that form this area of the city. Analysis of the different types of buildings and their use. And then coming down to a resolution that is spatial, that actually envisions how this space is going to be experienced, what type of environment is that you are creating, and how you think that this is uh, going to be used, right? So in that regard, I think it's, it's a very thorough, a very complete body of work that really illustrates uh, the, how, uh, uh, how you approach the, this project and the different you know, uh, uh, possibilities that emerge from looking at the city from this perspective. Now, the part that I feel that I, you know, I, will, I, will, I, I feel especially uh, for, a, for a couple of reasons, right? Being from Mexico and second, uh, you know, not knowing uh, 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 the city is, is a little bit more about where, where how is it that uh, having never been in Monterrey, right? I'm really curious about what Monterrey is about. What, was, what is your impression about Monterey? What actually drives the project 
from the uh, 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 from the, the city culture point of view. What are the aspects of uh, Monterrey as a city, or even you can even tell of of of, of Mexicans uh, uh, culturally that actually will make this project successful, right? So it's not the same, but I think it's what I'm trying to, to get here is that I'm, I'm find a little uh, point of criticism is that I find the solutions at the end rather kind of generic, right? Solutions that can be applied or implemented, you know, even when we are looking at this place, right? Uh, at this rendering, we don't know exactly where this could be made or why is it that is going to happen in Monterrey, right? And how is it that the people of Monterrey, once this uh, uh, project is implemented, can be uh, can make it very successful because it's part of the way they live, right? It's part of the the, the way they, they they work. The last, the very last, if you go up a, a couple of slides, going to previous slides, when you see the plan, right? That one, that one, not the next one, where we see the plans, is really interesting. I mean, this series of interior courtyards or plazas that you are showing over here are, are kind of a, a propositive, right? It's so, but it's something that we don't commonly see in Mexico, right? Something that doesn't really happen much, uh, unless you found a president similar to this one. But on, you know, there is something that uh, here that it can be uh, culturally, you know, a little bit difficult to, to embrace and to, to think about about that from the, uh, in terms of the realm of possibilities, right? Uh, and, and then when we're looking at the very last, you know, images and renderings, again, I, I kind of struggled, right? I was like, is that Dallas? Is that Denver? Is that Amsterdam? Is that, you know, what is it? Why is it that is this Monterey? So I, I, at, at, at the end, where, where I am going, I think, uh, or hopefully I'm trying to make a point here is, is to, to, to think about when you are looking at uh, this set of solutions that are, are very well oriented, very well done from the technical point of view, to think about more about what are the, what the cultural aspects of the city are, uh, are, what are said that, you know, people actually do, what the spaces are, for instance, we didn't see any public spaces in your presentation that illustrate how people actually hang out there and where they hang out and how is it that, you know, what are the spaces that work better versus the spaces that don't work as well and, and use those as an argument, as a backup, as a support for what you are proposing here. So there is some, some, some attachment to, uh, or some relationship to, to the cultural issues. And, 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 and just to finalize, finalize, I think also thinking about morphology on, on, on the, on the on, at the urban level, right? Uh, urban fabric over here. I think that you were distinguishing what were historic buildings and what not were historic, which ones were not historic and trying to assess somehow what the significance of the urban fabric will be. That's correct. That I think it's a really good uh, starting point by also thinking about, you know, uh, 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 the, the type of morph the morphology, type of buildings that exist there and why is it that they are there? Uh, that was all the other part that I was uh, trying to figure out through your presentation, through your explanations, and never got to see it. And at the end, these two components, right, the, the morphology or the urban fabric and, you know, how it feels in relationship to the cultural aspects, I think uh, will actually uh, be uh, good to uh, include uh, or, or the project will benefit from in order to make it even more stronger, right? In order to make it, in order to make it even stronger, sorry, right? In order to make it a, 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 a more, more um, a credible, uh, uh, and 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 not and and think about how is it that these these two components, and especially a cultural one, can make an impact and make an influence in ways in which you can design. I think it's very important, especially if we are looking at transformations of this nature, and if we are looking at you know. Uh, uh, bringing into uh, into the city this type of uh, public realm, public spaces. Uh, what is the evidence there that will make this space actually successful? Yeah, I thought that was. I, thought, I completely agree with uh, what you said, Ben. Too, and, and um, to kind of build on that and to be a little more, or kind of be more pointed. To um, totally, totally uh, loved you guys' intro work. On the analysis strategies diagrams and plans that was all 
very amazing um, breadth of work. I think I totally agree that it kind of gets lost in the renderings and I and kind of a pointed comment to, to Mindy and that rendering with the canopy um, that yet you were showing it's all the build up is great and then it gets here and I, and I just want to see more vibrancy in, in, in the rendering in the sense of um, but your both of your, your groups about adaptive reuse for buildings and I, and I want to see if you go to that rendering I want to see uh, that amazing shed building that you designed with that roof that has a uh, an active program inside spilling out on the left side of that canopy engaging that experience you know the food trucks aren't closed off with the backs they're active uh, maybe if you go to that rendering we, we can look at it while we're talking about it um, like on the right you know the, the food trucks are, are, you can see that engagement that experience and maybe on the left that's that markets that you uh, successfully figured out with that cool roof and the inside spilling out. Uh, maybe that's something you can maybe continue to polish this up uh, for your for your portfolio, but bring this to life to, to what ben, Benjamin was saying, like the, to the to the culture and, and experience in Monterey, but also tie that back into those architectural adaptive reuse interventions that you're doing. So you're kind of connecting the architectural work and this public space work together. And I think that would be a successful move to kind of continue to update these last renderings. And then for uh, Mezzi, I think for your your uh, build up to the glass renderings too, um, I think showing showing that before and after where you see that it, those existing buildings um, and how you're adapting, how, how the ground floor looks today and then the, the, that, that transition to that future, I think that will be key to see that transition. Um, so maybe think about that, adding that to, to your body of work. And then also there's a couple more of these renderings as you keep moving, you know, again, back to like the adaptive reuse of the buildings. Some of the buildings feel, um, maybe if you keep going one or two more renderings, the facades of the buildings just seem a little bit unpolished. Like I wanna see very, like this one, I wanna see, or sorry, that, that, that one you just had back up. I wanna see very active facades um, engaging the street uh, versus kind of uh, empty holes in those in those renderings, but I think seeing that before and after tra transition uh, I think will be key uh, to to continue to evolve these. But great, I mean, great initial work uh, to to build up to this stuff. Just to want to chime in on a comment on on adaptive reuse and and trying to I was trying to figure out where to an entry point for this, and I think the analysis is good that the um, the um, uh, and, 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 and I agree with a lot of the comments about situating this in Monterey. So for instance, I don't think I've ever seen a, a food truck in Monterey, but I have seen a great deal of, uh, of, of uh, commerce of various scales in the street. And so I know the focus is on adaptive reuse, but I think in particular, when we're talking about, you know, uh, your commercial uh, project about some framework for integrating, you know, the kind of uh, kind of ecology of commerce types and scales. I think one thing I'm seeing is that in this plan in particular is that it looks like this is all sort of, you know, major property owner developer driven development and reinvestment. Agree about the pro the 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 the, the, the comment about where the programming is coming from for all of this. But I think, you know, one thing which I'm beginning to understand about adaptive reuse and mixed use happening and not just at the scale of a district or a neighborhood or, but within a building itself is that part of that is about building in resilience for changes to the economy. And so, you know, um, you know, this year there may be a strong urge for this type of office space, but five years from now, maybe completely different. And will we have to demolish the buildings or are those buildings and building types flexible to be able to accommodate the changes over time? And I think that's more and more relevant um, for, uh, for, for, for today than ever. And so I guess, it, you know, uh, I think this is a good starting point. I guess my next point of departure would be to sort of zoom in to one or two of these particular spaces and think about um, possible range of uses, but also how about uh, a architectural expression can accommodate a possible sort of ecosystem of, uh, of uh, types of commercial activity um, <clears throat> with, within a building as an example of, of, uh, adaptive, of, of adaptive reuse. 
I'd like to chime in on this on this diagram as well. I think this is a, it's a great diagram, but I think it's maybe a little bit overly ambitious. Um, one of the things that I, I kind of keep asking when I when I look at this diagram is is how are all these spaces connected? I would like to see the the strategy that was applied for connecting the Plaza Alameda to to Plaza Purisima applied in in that situation. And, and how do I get from one point to another? And when you're really kind of in the fabric. When you're living in, in a fabric, especially uh, older cities like Monterrey and, and older cities in, in North America, it's really kind of about the shortcuts, about how you get to places. And that's really kind of where a lot of the magic happens in the streets. Um, you know, I want to know what's what's sort of tucked back. And on, on the diagrams for this one, connecting the two plazas, um, you did a great job in trying to um, pull people in from the street. And so you have these sort of secluded courtyards and, and in the diagram, if you go up a couple where you show where your entrance points are from the street, um, you know, that that's really kind of the, this diagram right here. It's 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 a great diagram because it does show you that, that there should be more than one entrance and that in order to pull people in from the streets, you have to give them a hint of what's in there and, and you you have to give them a, a sense to be curious and and show them that there's something that for them inside, which I think this diagram does great. The, the one thing that I would like to see, uh, I would like to have seen on, on this is sort of what happens at the end off, off to the left when you're, when you get to the end of the covered walkway, what's my signal that I need to turn right to go to Plaza Purisima? It's, it's like there's, there's one little thing missing that's the, the sort of final sign for me to turn to connect to the, to the plaza. It just sort of, you've got this great pedestrian experience and then I'm just back out onto a street. And so I'd like to see maybe that connected a little bit more. I mean, I was thinking about uh, Benjamin's comment about let's call it culturally specific interventions. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm certainly no expert on Monterey. I've spent what, four days there, but, um, as I recall, we spent a lot of that four days eating food. <laughs> and, um, you know, we met someone who was a real pioneer as a baker. Uh, we went to bread box, we went all of this stuff. And there is a kind of, my impression was, there's a kind of lack of that um, available in the DPA. Um, so I think actually I could see that one could build a case for um, a very specific intervention that is based around the opportunity for food, right? Whether, whether the garden is less a kind of French landscape and more, you know, I don't know what, growing jalapenos. Um, I, could, I could see a whole sort of agenda about, you know, the market is a place to buy food, the covered walkway becomes an esplanade where one can sort of try with street vendors, um, maybe there's culinary school or some kinds of other opportunities. I could see a whole kind of thematic um, agenda that you could build into this particular location as a very special location, linking, you know, uh, two sort of major public spaces in the city. And, and I think you need to be, if, if that was in fact the agenda, I think you need to be more explicit with sh explaining that, bringing in references for that, and definitely making the perspectives more qualitative in terms of uh, demonstrating the way in which that takes place. Uh, I want to I want to commend you guys for 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 the work you know because it is quite a bit of work that you have done and a lot of complex design solutions that you have introduced uh, to, to uh, implement the, the strategy. And again, to me, the strategy is, is quite strong. I think that the comment uh, that Ben um, shared on the, on the lack of cultural specificity is a very important one. And, and we should really think about that. Um, to be fair, we threw you a curveball because we, we, we went to Monterey for just a few days and it's, 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 it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to grasp the culture of a place like that in such a short time. And, and so the way I look at it, you know, 
there's there's basically two ways forward um, for for a project like yours. Uh, one w one way forward is okay. Now we really have to understand how this strategy is applicable in this context. We have to connect with this community. We have to spend time in the ground. We have to basically become of the place to see the way in which this uh, strategy can really weave in and be you know embedded with what is local. That's one way forward. The other way forward though, which may be, it may be more in line with, with your condition of, of being someone from, from the outside, right? We, 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 and, and that applies to me too, right? We should all acknowledge that, we, that we're not from there, um, is, is that maybe uh, you just can be even more deliberate about saying what we're providing is not a context specific solution. What we are providing is a is a framework, is a way of thinking, adaptive reuse, is a set of strategies, and we welcome you, local community or local government or a combination of the two, to to take ownership of 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 that. I was looking at the news this morning, and I was impressed to see that the city of Milan in Italy, a place close to my hometown, um, was adopting a series of uh, street temporary street improvement strategies for many of the streets of the center because of COVID, which were really resembling in many ways what New York has been doing um, with Jeanette Sarikan, a project that we as Gal know very well, uh, the improvements of Broadway. They were done almost 10 years ago, right? Um, if, not, if not even more now. So what, what was interesting to see is that at, you know, 10 years after those strategies, which were incredibly simple, you just kind of uh, widen the sidewalk uh, by positioning some temporary ball, uh, bollards on the, um, uh, on, the, on, the road, on the roadway, you uh, paint a temporary uh, bike lane, you transform an, you know, a, a turn by reducing the radii to accommodate more space and more, more visibility and more safety for the pedestrians. All of those strategies that were implemented 10 years ago in New York are still valid. And now they're kind of taken by the people of Milan to solve a very specific problem. So I appreciate you know, the, the aspect of the project that is uh, furthering some valid strategies that are uh, applicable in different contexts. Now, what you have not done, I think, is landing those strategies into the context. But in a way, you could claim that that was, you know, you may decide that that is not your intent. You just want to provide a strategy knowing that someone else will use them and make them theirs, if you will. I appreciate that more than designing something, um, presuming that you know what the people of Monterey want, and then failing at that. That's why I got a little annoyed when uh, John Mark in his great project, you know, called that Plaza, Plaza Mariachi, because it, it felt like a kind of a simplistic assumption with regard to, you know, what, what is Mexican. Some of you have uh, put some palms in, 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 in the drawings, which I also find very simplistic from a kind of a landscape patterns, understanding uh, point of view. Um, so, in a way, remaining neutral could be a safe way to approach this, but you have to, and this is why Ben's co comment is so important, you have to be very aware that you're not getting there. And it has, has to become like deliberate, knowing that you know, connecting with the, the, the community would be next step in order to get all the way. Yeah, and I, I think it, you know, a, Within the, the, your presentation, you were there some some top, 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 photographic documentation, right, of the spaces and how things are, you know, organizing and how people, you know, if if for instance in this project that we are looking at, Plaza Alameda and La Purísima are so relevant, show us a couple of pictures of those spaces and how they, you know, they are they are used. That will really help, you know, to bring that flavor. Beatriz is, can you turn off your microphone? Oh, thank you. Uh, so um, um, 
you can bring that, you know, that adds just adding some flavor. You know, I agree with with G, Gio, right? That Gio. Gigo. G, Gigo, sorry, Gigo. I, I agree, you know, but it's, it's definitely too much to ask to own the culture and say, I know how to do it. But some ingredient, you know, there, here and there, that show me that you are being aware of that. And then, and then that, that, that gives the flavor. I'm talking about perhaps some type of flavor to the presentation. Okay, um, and if there are, if we're done with the comments, then um, perhaps a few, I mean, I know a couple of you have only seen the one project or the one set of projects today, but you know, it's the end of a long semester, strange semester, um, you know, uh, starting out normatively, then going to Mexico and feeling, coming back, feeling like there was a lot of new energy and renewed commitment to the sort of problematic. And then all of a sudden kind of hit with this um, difficult distancing situation. Um, uh, I commend the students for how much work you all got done independently in your own bedrooms and living rooms and whatever, um, which I think is particularly difficult when you're dealing with a group project in which all of these pieces are um, connected together. So um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your guys' willingness to stick with it and getting involved with all of the conversations through Zoom every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, uh, Justin and, and Gail um, stepping up and, and spending like way more hours probably engaged with my students than probably you had originally anticipated um, as a result of all of this. Um, but I feel like maybe some final comments might be in order. Yes. Well, um, I want to, uh, and then I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Justin and, 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 and John speak too, because I'm sure they, they, they have things to say. Um, I, first of all, I would ask, unless you're absolutely unpresentable, to turn your camera on. <laughs> if you're absolutely unpresentable, don't. But if you are presentable and if you are in front of the screen rather than somewhere else, please turn your camera on so that we can have a little bit of a finale here. I, I, I want to say, um, I want to I wanna start by saying that there's been a critical moment in this studio and that has been, you know, I remember I was in the same space where I'm right now when we basically realized that it was over, that, you know, we couldn't meet in person anymore for the rest of the semester and something quite radical and, and tragic actually was happening at a global scale. And I remember very well, you know, the first time we had a call on Zoom and basically talked about the situation. And I remember that um, we didn't have, we the instructors, um, any space of maneuvering. We had to say, um, guys, we have to carry on. We have to march on. And to the point that we may have seemed insensible to your own very individual and personal situations in face of this um, emergency. Uh, I felt a little bit, you know, like um, when you are on the trail and you are, are guiding a, a group of uh, uh, hikers and, you know, there is a tough situation, you just have to, no matter how dangerous it is, we have to, we have to say, you know, we have to, um, we have to carry on. I just want to say in that moment, we knew that all of you were facing personal difficulties of different kinds. Uh, but in a way, we didn't have any alternative but say, let's let's move on, let's let's go forward. And now, you know, a few weeks after, I'm very glad that we were a little, you know, uh, firm in that situation because uh, it was uh, it was a way to say, yes, we can do it. And eventually now we see the, the results and, and, and we know very well that we did it, that we were able to go over this pretty big hurdle to reorganize ourselves, to work remotely, um, 
you know, let's remember it was a group group work cl class so that you had to collaborate with your peers from the distance. That is it's particularly difficult. Um, but nevertheless, we, we achieved some, some, some quite great results. I think, you know, these reviews show it very, very clearly. So I just want to thank you for your, for your energy, for your drive, for your stamina, um, through this, through this, uh, you know, uh, quite unconventional semester. Um, and then I want to also thank you for, you know, uh, what you demonstrated before this all came about, which um, was your uh, true interest in understanding what Monterey was about. Our trip was short, but was incredibly fruitful, I think. Um, thanks, among other uh, things, to the uh, you know, generosity of UR and the great guests and hosts that we had. Um, but it was really a sheer pleasure to see you guys engaging with the people of the city, uh, with the places you were visiting, uh, with one another um, and with us. Uh, finally, just two words on the actual results. Uh, as usual, we the instructors, we were kind of worried up until you know, the last minute, but you really uh, brought it home, brought it home big time and you know, you know that we want to work on a publication and, and I think there is absolutely great material to work with. So we can't wait to basically continue um, or restart this process after some deserved uh, rest to, to make, um, you know, to bring together your work to overlapping the layers um, and, 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 and see what happens when all of these projects, which are obviously complementing each other's come together into into an unicum so um congrats you guys and and thank you again from from the gal team yeah we I'll, appreciate I'll... you Gigo. <laughs> that was well said Gigo. i think for me again amazing amounts of, of work you guys have done i totally want to commend you guys on that effort and the reality of of the teaching situation and, 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 and working situation that we all, we all came about. Um, I'm, I was, I'm really, I'm still bummed that I couldn't physically be there every Friday with you guys in person, you know, sketching and tracing and, you know, just jamming out uh, and, and have that interpersonal connection with you guys. Um, but I think, you know, having, being able to still digitally meet, uh, it still feels like we're a part, you know, we're a community, we're still a part of this together. And I think you guys um, did a great job of, of um, coordinating that effort with us and um, you know obviously you know you guys had team efforts and it's a lot easier in person and I think you guys did a great job uh, digitally kind of connecting with each other uh, and you know seeing the evolution of the work has been a lot of it's been awesome to, to, to be a part of that and um, the, the, the kind of last couple of weeks you know, to where we are today I mean Ego, Dean and John and I were texting each other during this presentation like oh my gosh Look at all this amazing work. Where did this come from? This is amazing. <laughs> so again, like we're blown away with the work that was done and presented today. I just want to, again, congrats to you guys. And um, uh, it's been a fun time uh, teaching and uh, really loved collaborating with you all. Not to mention the problem of being a student and having to do with four different instructors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just, just to add to what uh, uh, well said, Gigo and Justin, and, and just to compliment what you guys have said, a remarkable body of work, you know, I think, and, and truly, you know, I've gotten to know Montre quite well, and I've learned something, I got some really good, uh, really powerful new insights from the work you've done. I think you've actually advanced, you know, uh, certainly our knowledge and the collective knowledge of what the possible future trajectory of this neighborhood is in terms of this neighborhood regeneration that's being spearheaded by Lab Ciudad and Uera and, and the goal for, you know, Monterey and, and for and nationally, it's a national priority actually to reinvest in city centers. And I think you guys have really captured some very powerful um, <clears throat> moves. I think sort of from a, some, a teaching pedagogical framework, I don't know, I haven't worked with you guys in other studios, but it's very hard to work in a collaborative environment and to sort of check your ego to be able to work toward a shared goal. So I really laud the fact that you all seem to have been able to do that successfully. It's not, not at all 
easy to do. I want to acknowledge that in the time of everything happening over Zoom, it gets even harder. So that to me is a remarkable accomplishment. And hopefully, you know, part of the the, the, the preview into what uh, life as a designer is like in terms of collaborative problem solving with cities. Cities are so complex and, and it's not about a single vision. It's about really uh, tackling the problem in a bunch of different ways. And you, the, the studio has demonstrated that and your, your individual work as a body of work collectively is, is, is so strong. And so you should all be very proud. And I, I've been very proud to be, be part of it. So Thank you all and thank the instructor team for just doing a great job in, in extraordinary circumstances. And then one, uh, uh, one, uh, one last uh, I got one uh, thought regard, uh, you know, to, to Dean for actually having the idea in the first place of doing this and for his incredible support. Uh, I mean, it was such a kind of a, um, you know, D Dean D did not know us uh, personally before we started this. So I really appreciate his, his faith in, in, in what we could uh, bring to this uh, endeavor and his uh, um, ability to, to, to make it work so smoothly and to, uh, you know, co-teach with us and, and provide such a kind of a strong uh, point of view to, um, on, on, the, on the approach and the pedagogy of this class. Uh, we then found out working together that we have, you know, very um, aligned point of views on, on many matters, which is, which has been, you know, very great to to, to discover. But uh, there were some unknowns. So 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 thank you for 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 really giving us the trust, um, Dean, to to do this together. And hopefully there will be more more opportunities to collaborate in the future. Yeah, Dean, I want to th thank you again for let letting us team up like that. Um, I know, you know, me personally supposed to be that physical, uh, you know, being in the, in the studio. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but uh, um, I really pre it's been a pleasure working with, with Gail and you guys and you, Dean, on the studio. Um, and also, one other comment just about uh, urban design pedagogy in general, um, you know, we have a mix of backgrounds as students, and I think it's important to acknowledge that you know, not everyone in the studio is an urban design student. Um, and I think that's important to recognize that urban design isn't, it's, you need those most interdisciplinary backgrounds uh, to have a successful uh, project and, and more, more successful studio. So I, you know, it's, I'm happy to have landscape architects, architects in the studio. And I think that's, you know, really important about urban design and, and the future pedagogical approach to that. So I, I hope you know the future, the landscape architects and the and Shelby and Imrahan and Jill. You know, if this inspires you to get an urban design masters, uh, you know, you know that's something that's possible. But um, again, I just want to talk, uh, reference that, and then you know, the future of pulling this all together in the summer, as Ego mentioned, you know, was, uh, finalizing the booklet so we can promote your work, and, we, and we'd be happy to kind of continue to engage you guys um, on that process.